It is true to honor to be the most host city for the final meeting of the Gulf Coast Ecosystem Restoration Task Force. I want to thank EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson and Director John Hankinson for choosing Pensacola as the site for this important meeting. I also want to thank the President for putting together such a top-notch team of professionals to help guide our recovery efforts. As the largest city in Florida impacted by the oil spill, we are a community that depends on the resilience and sustainability of the Gulf of Mexico. For over 450 years, this community has survived as part of the Gulf of Mexico. We are linked physically and economically to the Gulf, and your commitment to helping us build a new vision for this economy and this environment is important. I'd also like to thank Governor Rick Scott for being here today. Governor Scott has taken a real interest in this community over the, his short term as governor. In fact, this is the third time we've been together in the last few months. The last time we had a governor spend this much time here was when Governor Edward Perry, who was born in Pensacola, was elected in 1882. <laughs> Hopefully you didn't have to take a horse and buggy to get here from Tallahassee today, Governor. <laughs> governor Scott and his administration have helped lead the way for this recovery process in Florida. And the team you will hear from today is a product of his efforts. But meeting the challenge of building a more sustainable, more viable ecosystem and economy is one that will take all of us working together at the local, the state, and the federal level. So thank you all again for being here today. And it is my privilege and honor to introduce to you a man who understands the challenges our state faces because he faces them every day. Governor Scott, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks for the introduction. And it's always nice to, uh, to be in Pensacola. As you know, I ran for governor last year, and I spent a lot of time here uh, trying to make sure I got a few votes. And so, and it's a, it's a great place. I stayed at the, uh, uh, the Hilton Garden Inn, where I stayed in the campaign and saw a lot of the same people. So it was really nice. So Administrator Jackson, it's a, um, it's a pleasure to join you here today. Uh, task Force members, I want to thank you for the work uh, you are doing to ensure that the Gulf of Mexi Mexico, our state's lifeblood, uh, continues to thrive. When I ran for governor, I ran on a platform of getting our state back to work. That means doing everything in my power to make this state number one uh, for job growth. Matter of fact, I, there was a survey last week I, or two weeks ago from Chief Executive Magazine made us number three for the best place to do business in the country. And I called Governor Perry in Texas and told him his time's up. Uh, he's, uh, he had won for seven years. We have a bet on the Magic and uh, uh, the uh, Mavericks Heat game, and fortunately the Heat won last night, so I'm going to be getting some good barbecue sauce after we win three more games. Um, so I'm sure he's going to want to try to get out of the bet today. He can see his team has no chance. Uh, so reducing taxes, reexamining the size and cost of government, and removing burdensome, burdensome regulation has been my focus since taking office. I'm calling on businesses every day to tell them that these are the reasons to move to Florida. To complement all of these efforts, our pristine beaches, vast coastline, and great climate are among the most persuasive factors in convincing businesses and future Floridians to, to relocate to the Sunshine State. And I know any of you that don't live in Florida, I know your goal is eventually to live in Florida, and I'm, I welcome each of you here. <laughs> no matter what we do to create jobs, we must recognize that our coast and our economy are inextricably linked. As both an outdoor enthusiast and a businessman, I know this to be true. Last summer's oil spill had a big impact on our state's tourism industry, and we had some physical impacts too. Fortunately, we didn't have the same impacts as some other states. But we are moving forward, and here's proof. Just last week, Siesta Beach, located in Sarasota along the Gulf Coast, was named number one on Dr. Beach's top 10 list for having the whitest sand in the world. St. George Island State Park in Northwest Florida also made the list at number six. Last year, Florida's beaches were pulled from the list because of the oil spill. The task, I can tell you the, uh, the fishing's good. I had a fishing tournament the day before the anniversary of the oil spill. And uh, I only kept the fish that were legal, but uh, my guide and I caught 26 uh, redfish. Um, Nick Wiley's here from uh, Fish and Wildlife. We caught 26 redfish in about two hours. I did a bunch of interviews, and my, the first one I cast, I did a bad cast, and I caught a 40-inch redfish. <laughs> I made a mistake and said 40-foot redfish a couple times, <laughs> and so hopefully our charter captains are very busy right now. <laughs> This task force has an important job to do, and I ask that you consider not just the role you play in restoring our natural resources, but also the impact you will have on both our state and national economy. 
I am grateful for the opportunity to speak with you uh, today and look forward to working with you on our path to recovery. Thank you very much for all of your efforts. Thank you very much. Now let me do my housekeeping because I didn't recognize everyone. We wanted to give the governor uh, a chance to speak first, but I do want to uh, first, again, thank the mayor. He's hidden from me from view, but hello, mayor. Thank you for having us and thank you for welcoming us. I want to thank Secretary Herschel Vineyard. Herschel, please take stand up and introduce you. Who I had the pleasure of meeting this morning, but who's been up to Washington already to meet with my staff on a number of issues. Welcome and thank you. And uh, I have to say hello to Mimi Drew from Florida and all of her staff who did so much work to organize this and who insisted that we be here. So thank you, Mimi. <laughs> I understand we have a representative from the Florida House of Representatives, Representative Doug Broxson. Any other elected officials that we should have introduced them? Stand up, Councilman, absolutely. Grover? Hey, Grover. <laughs> Grover is also on our local government advisory committee for the Gulf, so thank you very much. Thank you for coming, sir. And we also have to give a special welcome, stand up now, to the international professionals who are here with the U.S. Department of State's International Visitor Leadership Project. Welcome. <laughs> welcome. Okay, now to work, because we have a lot to do and a limited time to do it. You've already met with John Hankinson. You know him, and you know, I hope, the work of this task force. This task force is about looking forward past the tragedy and the catastrophe and the work that was responding to the spill, that work goes on. And now, uh, as the President ordered, looking to the people of this region to help them make the Gulf that they envision, the communities resilient and strong that they envision along the coastline, the ecosystem that so many of us know as children of the Gulf and see as part of our heritage and our children's heritage, strong and healthy, and making our businesses and our economies uh, fit and thriving as well. All of those are part of this task force, but we have a special emphasis on the ecosystem. And as head of the Environmental Protection Agency, don't be surprised when I say that I think a healthy ecosystem is crucial to all those things, a healthy economy, as well as strong and resilient communities uh, as well. So that's the focus of our work here today. Uh, and we've certainly come a long way. Uh, the idea is that we're having listening sessions and we'll hear uh, uh, in just a few minutes about the way that the order of the day runs. The idea is that we have some presentations by folks from the region to talk about the region uh, and issues particular to our region here, but then we have listening sessions and we owe to the President a report by October. Uh, giving him our recommendations as a task force for what we believe would be uh, sound strategies and plans to move forward on how to restore our Gulf Coast. Um, I think uh, without much further ado, I will ask two things. Um, I'm going to ask the task force members to introduce themselves and particularly loudly say your agency name so people get a sense of not only who you are but who you represent. Why don't we start with Eileen. Hi, I am Eileen Sobeck. I'm a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fish and Wildlife and Parks with the U.S. Department of the Interior. I'm Helen Young, Deputy Commissioner of Coastal Resources for the Texas General Land Office. Good morning, everyone. I'm Larry Robinson, Assistant Secretary for Conservation and Management at NOAA and the Department of Commerce. And, and I, too, Governor, drove in from Tallahassee uh, yesterday as well. Uh, I'm from Tallahassee, so we could have to be home, right? <laughs> <laughs> Save money. Save some money that way. Yeah. I'm Erica Feller, Associate Director for Land and Water with the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Good morning. My name is Rock Salt. I'm with uh, the Department of the Army Civil Works, which has responsibility over the Corps of Engineers. Good morning. I'm Mimi Drew with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. <laughs> Garrett Graves with the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority of Louisiana. John Hankinson. <clears throat> Brian Griffith with EPA. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Gunnar Guy, and I'm the uh, Commissioner of Conservation and Natural <laughs> Resources for the state of Alabama. I'm Alice Perry with the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality. Good morning. I'm Leonard Jordan with USDA, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Actually, I represent the Undersecretary Harris Sherman. 
Good morning. I'm Ignacia Moreno. I'm the Assistant Attorney General for the Environment and Natural Resources Division at the United States Department of Justice, and I'm delighted to be back in Pensacola. And now I'd just like to ask the, co the Vice Chair, excuse me, um, of the Gulf Coast Ecosystem Restoration Task Force to speak. The Vice Chair is Garrett Graves, and before he speaks, I just want to acknowledge that it's uh, remarkable that he's able to be here uh, after the last few weeks of working closely to avert, I think, some of the worst uh, and dreaded aspects of flooding along the Mississippi River. He's made time, as he has uh, all along, for this task force, and we're really grateful for his leadership. Uh, coming from the person who's in charge of the environment for the whole country. <laughs> uh, I, um, I, I first want to thank the governor and, and the mayor for, uh, and, and uh, Mimi for, for hosting us. Uh, this, is a, this is a great city, it's a great state, and, and um, coming from Louisiana, um, I know you're all familiar with the annual migration of our citizens uh, to, the, to the Gulf Coast of Alabama and Florida every year, and in fact, it's an, it's an annual thing for our family. We've been doing it for decades now, and it's, uh, it's great to be back. Um, although I do have some criticisms as well. For you guys, and I want to talk about that for a minute. Um, first of all, I think that this is the second time in my entire life, Mr. Mayor, that I've uh, that I've actually sat inside for the whole day in Florida, and the first time is when we had our first meeting here. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping we can move this meeting outside, set up a tiki bar or something like that. I just want to remind you guys, we we had this meeting in New Orleans, we had the bar there, we had the we had the jazz music and everything else. So, uh, so I hope next time we come back and get different accommodations. Who's Mardi Gras? Details. We do that year round. Um, uh, seriously, um, thank you guys very much. It's a great state, and um, and and I really do enjoy coming here. Um, I was asked to, to give an update on, 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 uh, on the river, and I, and I first wanted to, to take a minute um, uh, just to talk a little bit about our charge. Um, I wanted to, um, to, to, to first, I want to thank the administrator for being here, and, uh, and I want to thank her. She, she is responsible for the environment for the whole country, and she has dedicated so much of her time uh, to be here in person, uh, to lead the, uh, the task force staff, uh, together with uh, with John and, and and I really do appreciate all the, the extraordinary commitment that she's made personally. I know that she uh, she plans on coming back and, and and becoming a resident of the Gulf Coast once again. Um, but, uh, but 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 I, I uh, so, somewhere near Florida uh, uh, and and I uh, I, I do uh, I really do appreciate her personal investment and personal interest in uh, in the Gulf Coast. It's been extraordinary. Um, but I also want to remind everybody, um, you know, Florida is a great place to come uh, recreate, a great place to, to have a business, uh, Governor. All the Gulf Coast states are. Um, incredible uh, contribution to the nation in terms of the, the, the economic contribution they provide, the natural resources they provide, um, really second to none when you take those five states and, um, and look at them holistically. Um, but I also remind you that every year, and, and um, Today is June 1st, right? So today's the start of, uh, of hurricane season. And I want to remind everybody that we're, we're, one, we're one hurricane away from a very different reality. And, and often what happens is that we find ourselves being reactive to those situations. Just like the high river vent that we're experiencing right now in Louisiana, <clears throat> in Mississippi, and in many other states. We find ourselves being reactive, reactive to those situations rather than leaning forward. The fact that we have the administrator's attention, the fact that we have all the states and all these federal agencies that have a stake in the resiliency and the sustainability of the Gulf Coast, all here, all very present and making this a priority. Folks, I just want to urge everybody, this is a rare opportunity for us to be proactive. We have all, as end users, as states, as, as many folks in the NGO communities, local government representatives, we're all the end users of, of, of what happens here amongst all these federal agencies. And in some cases, we see conflicts, and in some cases, we see great complementary efforts. But we're the ones who need to be defining the challenge here. We need to be defining the goals here. We need to be defining the obstacles here for this task force to resolve. The administrator, the chairman, just reminded us that we're supposed to be finishing a strategy by October. We have very, very limited time. And I really want to encourage everyone here to share your thoughts in terms of the obstacles. We just made an announcement a month ago so we, re we finalized a negotiation with BP to contribute a billion dollars to early restoration. One billion dollars. That's a great accomplishment. But now you know what? We have to spend it. And it's something we talked about months ago. We talked about the scenario 
whereby we were going to be in a situation to have a billion dollars in the bank and to think about at that time what were the obstacles to us spending that money? Is it state regulation? Is it local ordinances? Is it federal conflicts? What is it? And let's identify those things and let's get those obstacles out of the way so we can efficiently restore the Gulf. So we can efficiently ensure a resilient future for the Gulf Coast. We're at that, folk, uh, at that spot now, folks. We are. We have the billion dollars in the bank. And so we need to very quickly begin eliminating these obstacles. Um, uh, some of the challenges that I know we've experienced in Louisiana is, is uh, under NOAA we, we have a, a coastal zone management program and, and, and in some cases we've seen the, the, the dredging of the use of sediments from the river uh, used in a manner that's inconsistent. Let's find ways to address those problems. In Louisiana we have levees that have, that have segregated uh, or sequestered the freshwater and the sediment from the adjacent wetlands and when we try and build diversions to reestablish that connection between the river and the adjacent wetlands, we've run into some policy conflicts there uh, related to navigation and induced shoaling. We're never going to be successful and we're going to continue to be responding, responsive to disasters, spending exponentially more dollars, responding to disasters rather than taking this rare opportunity to be proactive. We have some great plans that have been developed amongst the states. I know that uh, the state of Florida took us uh, out yesterday to show us uh, one of the projects underway here. Um, in, in an effort to, to improve the, uh, restore the ecosystem. And, and I think we have examples, we have plans uh, across the Gulf Coast to carry out that, that have been on the books in some cases for years and in some cases are under development. Let's figure out how to integrate these plans, where the commonalities are in terms of the challenges, in terms of the symbiotic relationships and pushing those as quickly as possible. Like yesterday, uh, strategically establishing oyster reefs uh, to establish living shorelines, to, um, uh, to ensure that you can have a healthy ecosystem while at the same time addressing wave attenuation or, or, or reducing storm surge for your communities. So benefiting the environment and benefiting your communities, improving, improving the resiliency of the Gulf Coast that relies so much upon the natural resources in this area. Um, so I, I just wanted to take a quick moment and just remind folks of your role here. You're the end users. You see what it's like to be a customer of this government process. And I really urge you to share the challenges that you've seen, share the experiences that work, and help guide us in our efforts because this is a rare opportunity to be proactive. And we can't lose this one, we can't miss it or strike out. Um, now why I was actually asked to, uh, to talk. <laughs> and I got three minutes left on the schedule, so I'm, I'm watching my watch here. Um, uh, I was asked to give a quick river update. And uh, in Louisiana, Mississippi is a, a very, very unique, they're, they're in a very unique situation. And that 41% of the, the, the continental United States, um, 31 states, two Canadian provinces, all drain through our states. And so we have this major thoroughfare of water that comes through um, our, um, our states, uh, which, which normally is okay, except when you're in a situation like now where, where you literally have a 30 or even 40 foot differential between the, the, the water and the river and your adjacent land. Uh, the role of the levees uh, could not be more important uh, today than, than, than ever. Um, at the same time, uh, Madam Chair, we have hundreds of locations where we have seepage points, we have sand boils, uh, we have uh, water flowing through these levees. In fact, uh, I think I was telling you last night, there, there are areas where, um, uh, where, where the water is 30 feet up on the levees on the, on the riverside, and you can literally stick your foot in the levee and sink up to your knee. It's not a very comfortable feeling. And so these systems, the, the, this Mississippi River and tributary system, these levees are being tested like they've never been tested before. So far, things are working. And, and, and I, I really want to thank NOAA, I want to thank the Corps of Engineers. Um, this is a very different flood than we experienced in 1927. We had two or even three weeks to prepare for this, uh, to actually get out there and, and put the sandbags in place, to repair the levees, to put uh, uh, protective or mitigation options in place to ensure that this becomes a record because it's a high water event, not a record because it's a disaster. And um, I want to thank the cooperation of the federal agencies. So far, things are going well. Uh, they really are, but, but I want to remind everyone that the duration of this high water event is, is unprecedented. Uh, additional water in the Missouri River Basin is expected to come down, uh, and, and we're experiencing, uh, we're going to be expecting record high water levels for weeks. Uh, so this really is going to be an incredible challenge and really test the capacity of this river system. Um, last point I want to make is that um, 
Part of Coastal Louisiana's plan, together with the, with the Corps of Engineers and many of the other federal resource agencies, is to develop diversions, to reconnect the river with the adjacent wetlands. In doing that, you don't just reestablish that process that Mother Nature had, where the, where the fresh water and the sediment got back out into the wetlands and helped to nourish those areas and reduce the, uh, improve water quality, reduce hypoxic conditions, but also they provide a, a pressure relief valve for the river to where we wouldn't be sitting there with water levels 30 or 40 feet above the adjacent lands in this very precarious situation we find ourselves in today. And so this task force actually plays a role in being able to take advantage of the next high water event where we can reestablish that connection, where we can uh, establish um, um, uh, diversions or pressure relief valves for this incredible river system. And so. Um, uh, I, I urge you to continue crossing your fingers, continue praying for the future of these communities uh, adjacent to the river, um, but also uh, take very seriously this charge that, uh, that we're all facing here today with, um, with ensuring a resilient future for the Gulf Coast. Thank you very much, Garrett. And uh, as you can see, we just wish Garrett was a little more enthusiastic. That's <laughs> all we wish. But um, I really, I don't know how much sleep he was getting the last time I saw him, but um, it has been an amazing ride. And Luckily for many people, not as bad as, uh, as feared. Um, let's move on now to um, hear about today. Um, I'm going to ask one favor. I didn't introduce Gwen Keys Fleming, who's sitting right here in the front row. <laughs> Heidi and Gwen, let's get you guys seats up here. And if there's any uh, other staffers who are sitting, let's move out just so we can. Um, um, there, there's so many people standing around, I feel bad. There must be some folks who are tired. Let's get them seats in the front, maybe over here on the Try side. Try some more chairs in Yeah, chair. okay, good. All right, you don't have to give them up till you get a chair. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. Uh, all right, John, why don't you tell us about today? Thank you, Madam Administrator, Governor. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here with us today. Mm -hmm. and Thank you for all the uh, support with Mimi Drew and your staff over at uh, mm -hmm. Secretary Vineyard's office and Gill's office uh, have been very helpful in trying to help us form the type of strategy that Garrett uh, talked about, which is a uh, proactive rather than a reactive strategy. Kind of a strange concept in the Gulf to think that we might be able to have actually a proactive strategy. We, we have to react to so many calamities uh, here. Um, but I am delighted. Um, I guess it's no secret I am a Floridian. Um, um, and I'm pleased to be back in the state of Florida. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to, uh, to see that um, Mimi and, and her staff will have an opportunity to talk about some of the great aspects from the, of the Gulf from, from Florida's perspective and what sort of restoration priorities that uh, uh, the state would like to focus on uh, in this process. Um, uh, as the administrator noted, I was sworn in here in Pensacola the first day. Um, um, uh, as I said, like to say that I was, I've been sworn at ever since, but uh, uh, I wanted to thank all of the people. I saw Casey Calloway out. I think Casey gets a perfect attendance button, um, and probably others here, that we've gotten so much support and input from citizens across the country, really, um, who are interested in what, what will happen with the Gulf. And I think that's our challenge, is to make, make the people of the Gulf, as um, Garrett suggested, we have five great Gulf states, and we need to have the nation understand just how important it is and what the uh, cha challenges are that we still have to face down in the Gulf to keep it uh, remarkable. So uh, um, we're working on, on our, our development, our strategy that's due in October. Uh, we're meeting with the task force members now on a weekly basis uh, and sort of a workshop uh, discussion uh, of, of where we are in our drafts. Uh, that's been very helpful to get their direct input. Uh, the states have sent uh, representatives to uh, to Washington to help, uh, and that's been a tremendous help to have the state perspectives, and uh, we're going to intensify our efforts to work at the state level, bringing our folks down here to uh, um, to work to develop a sort of a state implementation approach that will support the uh, the ecosystem strategy that we're we're developing. So, I'm I'm very pleased. I'm looking forward to uh, Helen being in Galveston June 27th for our next task force meeting. Um, it's a wonderful place as well, and uh, maybe Governor, you want to come and talk to Governor Perry and uh, he, he can help his bet. Yeah, that's right. That, that, uh, we can help. Can we can help you uh, recover that. No, and you couldn't eat all of that barbecue yes. sauce by yourself. We're having our meeting outside. <laughs> no, I'm <cheating>. yeah. <laughs> uh, And we did have a and, and Mayor, Mayor and, and, and Grover Robinson and, and local folks uh, at the DEP office really had a great tour <coughs> last night of a project they're doing a, a living shoreline project here in uh, 
uh, Pensacola that I think is just the kind of model that we're looking for to uh, help uh, establish resilient communities at the same time improve the environmental quality of the Gulf. So um, with that, Mamie, I'm going to call on you to, uh, uh, this is going to be your your show. I'm, can, can, I'm I do, can I do a piece of housekeeping? We, we can't bring any more chairs in. The fire code won't allow it. So we can take a 15 minute break here and move to the theater. Um, I, I really think that's probably better because there are a lot of people who'll be standing for hours if, at this rate. So unless it, any strong objection, we're not really behind schedule. We'll move over to, is it called the theater? Yes. The main theater. All right, so. so sit up in the front, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Administrator Jackson and Administrator Fleming, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it, it's an honor to have both of y'all here on the same day. Um, I appreciate uh, Governor Scott for being here. Um, we receive a daily schedule of his activities. Uh, he's clearly a man in, in high demand. He is, he is constantly uh, on the move. And the fact that he spent some time with us this morning, I think, reflects how much this administration cares about the health of the Gulf of Mexico. And finally, task force me members, I want to welcome all y'all to uh, sunny Florida. I'm so glad uh, y'all are here with us today. As the governor highlighted, environmental stewardship and economic development are intertwined in the state of Florida. You really can't have one without the, uh, the other. Uh, Florida's brand, if you will, is our natural resources, our beautiful beaches and uh, other marine habitats. So it's important that we continue to rebuild our brand following what's happened in the past year or 18 months. I'm so glad that the task force is here to help us with that task. I spent time yesterday evening with, uh, with a number of y'all uh, looking at our project Green Shores, which is really, it's a, a community-based uh, environmental restoration project. You know, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection was certainly involved as well. We, we had some federal partners uh, involved, including NOAA, on that. But it's terrific. Florida knows how to perform restoration. We've got 30 acres essentially in downtown Pensacola where we've, we've rebuilt uh, oyster reefs. We've got seagrass habitat and it's, it's fantastic. We heard stories from the folks that live here in Pensacola that that's now where the fishermen come and, and get their bait and, and uh, they bring school children out there. So it's really been a win-win for both the environment and this community. Uh, DEP, as I said, we know how to do restoration. Uh, we've got an exciting road ahead of us with the, with the task force, and I certainly look forward to, to working with the task force members to restore Florida's Gulf Coast, as well as the coast of Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, and, and my home state of Texas. So thank you so much, and Mimi, I'll turn it back over to you. Secretary Vineyard. Um, just to give you all a little bit of preview of what we're going to do this morning. First of all, Governor Scott um, sends his regards. He did have to leave. He's got a very packed schedule this morning, but he sends his appreciation to everyone for being here and would reiterate what Garrett Graves said earlier is that it's going to take all of us to make a, a really good plan for the Gulf and encourage everybody to stay involved. So um, what we're going to do this morning, I'm going to do a very brief and quick slideshow to give you a bit, a bit of background about what Florida is all about. And then we've got um, an agenda of some excellent speakers that are going to give you a um, perspective on some of the issues we're dealing with in Florida. The Gulf of Mexico is a very special place to the country and especially to Florida. The waters and coastlines that support all of these vital activities are very important to us in some of the ways that you see on this slide. I'm going to give you a very brief visual preview of some of these items and we'll get into some in more detail later in the agenda. Florida Gulf Ports, you're going to hear a report on ports and the importance of ports to the Gulf later in the agenda. I want to highlight the Port of Panama City and a container ship here off the Port of Panama City. 
Florida Gulf military. Again, you'll hear more about the importance of the Gulf to the military, but here's a shot of the Blue Angel jet. I'm sure many of you have seen them in action at the Panama City Air Show and the USS George W. Bush. Florida is a land of contrast. You and your family can enjoy the Magic Kingdom, or you can pick a campsite and create your own Magic Kingdom. You can go to Disney World, Orlando, and enjoy a parade every four hours, or you can take a private seat and enjoy an ever-changing ocean view. You can plan a vacation around the last shuttle launch in July, or you can plan for something more predictable and watch the seasonal bird migration. You can take the kids to swim at SeaWorld's new Aquatica theme park, or you can go to the Florida Keys and dive North America's only barrier coral reef. You can go to the Everglades and watch alligator wrestling, or you can go to nearly any water body in the state and see one in the wild, or two, <laughs> or more. <laughs> you can go to SeaWorld and you can watch the orcas swim, or you can go to Homosassa Springs State Park or one of the many other freshwater springs and coastal areas in Florida, and if you're lucky, you'll see the, ho you'll see the manatees in the wild. You can tour an orange grove in Florida, or you can hike some of the thousands of miles of hiking trails that crisscross the state from coast to coast. You can drive in any direction within Florida and reach a Florida public beach, park, spring, river, or other natural water attraction to surf, dive, swim, or fish, or just relax. Or you can go to Wet n' Wild for the day and have fun at a theme park. We're known for our sandy beaches. As the governor mentioned, we, um, we're on the top 10 list. We have three beaches this year on the top 10 list from Dr. Beach. Um, and the beaches always, we always have beaches ranking in the top 10. And we're proud of those. You'll see some in this, in this area if you get a chance to get out and about. The waters are emerald clear, especially during the summer in northwest Florida. And the dunes that you see <clears throat> protect our vital ecosystems inland. No matter what the weather, the beaches are gorgeous and people from all ages, from all over the world, enjoy them. Our living marine resources, such as bays and estuaries, are just as vital to us as our sandy beaches. We have miles of these types of areas in the bays and estuaries, and they provide wonderful recreational mm -hmm. habitat, as well as air nursery areas for all the critters. Seagrass beds and oyster bars. You've already heard this morning about Project Green Shores a couple of times. We have a, a fabulous project right here in Pensacola um, to restore seagrass beds and oyster reefs. You can see it when you drive along the bayfront. Um, and as you know, we're famous for our oysters in the Panhandle. <coughs> Coral reef and mangrove forest. If you haven't made it down to the Keys into South Florida, you really need to do that. The coral reefs are stunningly beautiful, and they're easy to see with just a snorkel. The mangroves are interesting because they look weird, but they actually serve an important purpose of building storm protection, building land, and actually creating habitat for many animals. Everybody wants to live near or on the water in Florida, and we have quite a bit of coastal development. 80% of our population live within a mile of the coast. This brings with it challenges in terms of community resiliency, yeah. water quality, and habitat protection. However, if coastal development is done right, it's a fabulous place for people as well as plants and animals that make up the underlying food chain and support our human activities. Who doesn't like to sit on a deck and watch the sunset while enjoying a delicious dinner? And you can do that in many places in the state. You can find a quaint cottage-like atmosphere in Mexico Beach, or if condo living is your style, there's plenty of that too. We have some really important areas in Florida called protected special areas. They're protected because they're special to both people and ecosystems. Can you guess where the picture on the left was taken? If you guess the Bahamas, you'd be wrong. It's actually St. Andrews State Park, which on, an, on, on a good day really does look like the Bahamas. We have many state parks that include these protected special areas, and they are some of the most productive ecosystems in the world. Florida has one of the largest and most, most diverse state and federal conservation and recreation lands programs in the country. 
These two maps give you some idea of that. By protecting lands through acquisition and preservation, Florida has been able to keep many important types of ecosystems healthy and diverse. Florida is home to many protected species. Here are two of them. We have a nesting loggerhead sea turtle and a bottlenose dolphin. Eagles are making a comeback and they're frequently sighted near coastal areas. Coastal wetlands protect habitat for many other kinds of birds such as this egret. And I've always counted myself lucky to see a roseate spoonbill, but in certain parts of Florida you can see them pretty much all the time. And you can find a great blue heron in just about any place that's wet in Florida. Fishing and boating are huge pastimes in Florida, and they're something that everyone in the family can enjoy, as well as providing revenue to the state. Whether you charter a fishing boat or just throw a line in from the shore, it's all fun. Commercial fishing is also a big industry here, and you'll hear a little bit more about that later in the presentations. Whether houseboating is your style or fast motoring, we have it all. And if you enjoy quiet, canoes and kayaks are the way to go, or you can be loud and fast on the next slide, jet skis. Do you want to get married on a barge? We can actually provide that. <laughs> <laughs> if you really want to test your core strength and agility, try windsurfing. So Florida is all about getting outside, in, on, or near the water. Either way, we're the sunshine and water state. I'd like to end by recognizing some of our very important partners in all of our efforts to maintain our coastal areas. I'd also like to thank Visit Florida, Enterprise Florida, Walt Disney World, and the DEP <coughs> Division of State Lands for providing such great photos. So with that introduction, I'd like to go into the presentations and introduce our first guest. Dr. Steve Morosky is a distinguished research professor at the University of South Florida at the campus in St. Petersburg, and he's going to give us a scientific overview of the Gulf. Dr. Morosky was previously the chief scientist for the U.S. National Marine Fisheries Service, holds a PhD, Master's of Science, and, Bio and Bachelor of Science from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst in fisheries biology. Dr. Morosky? Thank you so much, um, and thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. Uh, what I'd like to do... Let me rack up that presentation. Hmm. What I'd like to do today is two things. Number one, to emphasize the importance of natural resources in Florida to a healthy Gulf ecosystem. There are some great challenges and great opportunities in restoration activities that can be undertaken in Florida that have a major impact on the functioning of the overall Gulf. The second thing I'd like to do is to emphasize the importance of science in the restoration activities. And a uh, part of this reflects a meeting that we had with the, the staff, uh, including John Hankinson, uh, at the University of South Florida. And it was a meeting of 20 different scientific uh, institutions uh, in uh, Florida that talked about the importance of science in, in terms of backstopping um, what you all are doing in terms of measuring progress in restoration activities. So I, I'm a bottom liner, so I'd like to give you my bottom line now and then go through you know, the evidence. So first of all, uh, I will assert that restoration and protection of ocean and coastal resources uh, of Florida are vital to a healthy Gulf ecosystem. Uh, the um, connectivity of the um, nearshore areas to the deep water parts of the Gulf, the productivity of some of the uh, ecosystem types, such as mangroves and the uh, extensive seagrass beds in the, in the Big Bend area, are absolutely critical to a uh, functioning Gulf ecosystem, and they represent great opportunities in restoration activities. Um, secondly, the second point I want to make is that science can help you all in restoration planning in a number of uh, critical ways. First of all, uh, to help set achievable goals. Um, a lot of times what we do is look in terms of restoration activities either in a temporal context that we want to restore back to some arbitrary date, um, assuming that we have a baseline in that arbitrary date that represents some better environmental uh, quality. Uh, we can also use models and more advanced methods to, to look at what the outcomes would be um, through modeling of 
uh, pollution abatement, uh, restoration of wetlands, and other things. And so, so science has a dual role of um, looking at the archives from the past as well as looking at more advanced methods to uh, set these goals. And the emphasis there, of course, is on achievable. Secondly, to monitor progress. Uh, we all need a report card in life, uh, schools, the economy, and other things. And you all will be held to a report card as well. And I think we've seen very um, important restoration <coughs> activities around the country that emphasize a report card, like the Chesapeake Bay Restoration Program and others. And they get great public support. People want to see and they want to know the outcomes of the activities that we're planning. And so um, uh, the uh, assembled scientists that we talk uh, with uh, really wanted to emphasize this report card uh, set of metrics, and I'll talk about metrics in a minute. Third, to help you all prioritize restoration activities. I know uh, under the early restoration efforts, um, you all have a long list from the states and I'm sure the federal agencies about what you want to restore. But you know, what are the biggest bangs for your bucks? Um, what are the, where can we have the most leverage on the outcomes for natural resources and for people? And what is the cost effectiveness of what you're trying to do? And this is where not only hard science, but social science is absolutely critical to your role. Um, and fourth, we can provide ecosystem level understanding of the linkages. Um, that is, uh, restoration activities like we heard about in, in Pensacola. How does that link back to ecosystem processes in the, uh, in the ocean? What's the incremental benefit of that to you know, resources that may not live here but part of the year? Third uh, point I want to emphasize is that monitoring and control areas need to be established at the outset of restoration. It makes no good different, uh, it makes no sense for us to establish monitoring pro programs partway through a restoration effort because you really can't understand the totality of what you're doing. And, and in particular, uh, through the, um, the response effort for Deepwater Horizon, we saw um, people pacing themselves a bit in terms of um, jumping out and trying to restore, say for example, some of the wetlands, but actually reserving some of those areas as control areas. And if we're going to really understand the um, the, the toolbox we have for restoration efforts for things like oil spills. Having control areas where we actually don't do anything is important because that gives us some level of contrast. Um, next point I want to make, um, and this is an important one I think for you all, and that is setting goals for restoration activities should incorporate the likely impacts of storm surge and sea level rise. Um, if we're uh, altering a hydro hydrographic um, profile of wetlands and other things, it makes no good it's no good for us to uh, put that back in April 2011. Um, you know, we know that the storm uh, surge and in particular sea level rise is a, is a, a particular problem <coughs> in the Gulf region and I'll show a couple of slides on that. Um, uh, second to last, uh, that compensatory restoration projects need to be carefully considered. Uh, that's kind of a throwaway line. But the point is there are many proposals for so-called compensation. Uh, in restoration. And that is, um, some things are going to be impossible for us to actually physically restore, like the deep coral ecosystems. There's, there's no thing that we can do down there to replant deep corals. And so uh, there are many proposals for things like marine protected areas. Well, marine protected areas uh, you know, have benefits and costs. And so understanding the totality of uh, all of those compensatory restoration projects is important. And last, um, and that is uh, societal goals need to be incorporated through a transparent, credible, and emphasis on adaptive approach. And this is where science is so important in trying to uh, adapt to um, the scientific findings that we're accumulating. So with that bottom line, I'd like to go through these slides rather quickly. Okay, good. So um, this graphic, the graphic of the Gulf without water in it, is important for a couple of uh, reasons. Number one, um, if you look carefully, there's two important pieces of geography here. Number one, the, the uh, DeSoto Canyon. DeSoto Canyon is a very large uh, canyon-type feature in the Gulf of Mexico. Interestingly, the, the water uh, mass movements are along that canyon, and unlike the surface waters, the waters move from southwest to northeast. And so um, we saw transport down to the southwest uh, in, in, uh, in a lot of sampling that EPA and NOAA and others did down there, but also water mass movement to the northeast into that canyon. The reason I emphasize that is that uh, the offings of the canyon, the, the head of the canyon is an important fishing area, not only for people from Florida, but also from, from Mississippi and Alabama as well. And so we're starting to see the potential impacts of water mass movements along that canyon as it might affect fishery resources. The second point I want to emphasize here is that uh, the, the Big Bend area, um, you know, basically from Panama City South, uh, is in a, a huge 
hugely important wetland for the Gulf of Mexico region. I'll talk about it in a second. The third point I want to emphasize here is that Red Star uh, next to Cuba, and that, that was no pun intended there. But uh, the importance of that is uh, the Cuban government is going to start drilling there probably in September, you know, for oil. And to the extent that we did not get any oil on the beaches because of the vagaries of the loop current, you can see that that transport system, if something happened there, it would be immensely important to Florida in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in terms of the surface circulation, this is the, the, the Gulf with water. Um, this is a, a shot actually was taken right after the oil spill, and you can see the very large feature, the, the loop of very warm water. This is a, a, a temperature graphic for the Gulf, and you, you see the loop current connected. And of course, one thing we all know is that loop separated into a, an eddy and basically kept a lot of the oil from getting onto Florida beaches, particularly from Tampa South. Interestingly, uh, in early May this year, the picture looked exactly the same. Another eddy separated, but it immediately rejoined. And so if this year was last year, we'd have a very different scenario in terms of the oil spill trajectories. Uh, the, the importance of that is that we need monitoring activities in order to, uh, number one, understand the impacts of restoration, but number two, to be better prepared for events like this. Um, third graphic I wanted to emphasize is the nature of all the science that's going on in the Gulf right now. And, and uh, if nothing else, this um, graphic gives a list of a variety of projects, some connected and some not connected with each other. Um, there are ongoing state and federal efforts to understand the response and the NRDA uh, impacts uh, in terms of natural resources, seafood safety, and other things. There are academic uh, efforts ongoing. Uh, BP uh, granted uh, funds not only to Florida, but Mississippi, Alabama, and Texas to do a variety of things. In Florida, um, we got a $10 million grant from BP to, um, uh, through the Florida Institute of Oceanography, which is a collaboration of ten, uh, 20 um, institutions. Um, they just had a scientific symposium this past week on uh, some of the new research that's coming out of that. Of course, I think you're all aware of the, the centers that BP is, is uh, proposing to create. Um, that was a wildly popular call for proposals. Um, uh, and we'll see what, what that amounts to, but the point is there will be some sustained effort in terms of observing. Um, Fourth, um, we have a, a new project that's just uh, starting up, and that is a, a survey of fish diseases throughout the Gulf. And this is important because in this particular region, we're starting to hear of uh, uh, fish, uh, particularly red snapper and vermilion snapper with lesions and other things. And last, um, there are ongoing federal um, efforts uh, through rapid grants and NSF and others. The point here is that these efforts need to be well coordinated if we're going to have a, a science approach that supports the restoration activities. Now, the Big, big Bend area is, is vitally important. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's a, an amazing place in terms of the quantity and quality of seagrass beds, notwithstanding some of the changes that occurred from 1984 to 92 in this graphic. It still represents the most pristine area of seagrasses in the Gulf of Mexico, not only in the Gulf of Mexico, but in, the United, in one of the most important areas in the United States. Um, there are ongoing threats to this um, region in terms of the productivity of these seagrass areas, and that includes uh, increased upland use for forestry and agriculture, nutrient enrichment, of course, in coastal areas, hydrologic alterations, uh, change, changes in river flow. There's a, a tremendous amount of development pressure in this region. It has probably the largest um, quantity of undeveloped coastal land in Florida, and uh, the lower left-hand shot is one development company's uh, land holdings in this region. And of course, um, uh, storm surge and sea level rise will be an important issue here. Uh, so this is, represents a real opportunity to help preserve a, a, a set of ecosystem components that are not yet highly degraded. Uh, so the, the, uh, the other uh, major eco ecotype that I wanted to emphasize are the mangroves. And mangroves occur in Florida all the way up to Cedar Key. Um, it, the, historically, some of the mangroves have been highly degraded, particularly in areas around uh, Tampa Bay and other places. And uh, so for the example here, Tampa Bay has lost about 44% of its uh, mangroves over time as development activities have created a lot of um, bulkheading and other things. But one thing we know is that mangroves are relatively easy to restore. You start out by restoring the hydrologic cycle and the, salt, and the um, salt marshes, and then mangroves will intrude on those. And so um, mangroves stabilize the wetlands, and they also are tremendously productive in terms of export offshore. So there's a real opportunity in mangrove restoration and protection here as well. 
Uh, next graphic um, looks a little bit at the uh, sea level rise scenarios. Um, the, the, the map at below uh, represents the areas that are uh, uh, at most extreme risk for sea level rise. And, and of course storm surge issues, and you can see large red areas off the Louisiana coast, but also in the Big Bend area and down in South Florida. The graphic at the top right represents a, uh, a century of sea level rise measurements taken um, from, from gauges around the country. And they indicate that on average, sea level rise has been about 20 centimeters over the century uh, for all those data combined. If you look at places like Barataria Bay and some of the other Gulf places, they've risen 30 centimeters since 1950. So what we're saying is that this is probably one of the areas, and I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know, at most extreme risk in the country in terms of sea level rise. And of course, that, that's important for our planning. Now, uh, also, um, you know, one of the outcome measures that you're all uh, certainly interested in is the performance of natural resources, and, and chief among those is fishery resources. Um, in planning uh, the activities that you're all going to undertake, we have to look at the background of activities in fisheries as well. And fisheries management has is, is been very aggressive in this, this region. There's been major reductions in uh, the amount of fishing effort, not only in things like shrimp trawl fishing, but also offshore pelagic fishing for things like tunas. Part of this is re as a result of economic uh, forces, um, the, the very large um, import of uh, lower quality shrimp into the uh, Gulf has resulted in, in reduction in amount of fishing effort. The other uh, thing, of course, is that Hurricane Katrina reduced the fleet uh, at a very large extent and that the fleet has never recovered. So if we're looking at outcomes and natural resources, you have to put the picture together. So uh, just to sort of emphasize that connectivity, this is a vignette diagram that my colleagues at uh, NOAA put together. There are a lot of simultaneous activities that are ongoing in the Gulf of Mexico that we have to interpret our restoration activities against. And they include the disruption from you know, events, uh, aperiodic events like hurricanes. They include the water quality issues um, like nutrient uh, inputs into the Gulf. Um, they also include the loss of wetlands. Uh, on the floor, West Florida shelf, you've got uh, harmful algal blooms that you know are, are periodic and under a variety of controls. And so, so putting this picture together in a quantitative sense is important as we look at the effectiveness of various restoration activities. And just to put a finer point on that, again, um, uh, so uh, the scientists in the region have gone one step further and started to look at conceptual models about how to put that picture together. Um, this, this diagram basically looks at a, a variety of, of factors that influence the ecosystem here, from coastal sediments and nutrients to the hydrologic cycle to the connectivity to offshore. Uh, the only point I really want to emphasize here is that if you look at all these boxes, the wetland habitats have the most arrows going in and, in and out. They are the central part of this because of the estuarine dependency of so many species. And so, you know, one of the things that, that is obvious here is that if we do nutrient abatement uh, strategies, um, they also interact with sediment restoration strategies. And so one, one uh, important scientific question we have is, um, if in fact we are gonna divert uh, things like um, the amounts of sediments, you know, coming down the Mississippi and other rivers, um, will that actually also give us um, nutrient abatement at the, at the source level as well? So there are a lot of questions that, that this entails. So the last few graphics I have are, you know, what are the type of scientific questions that can be asked by um, the restoration uh, planners and how will science actually um, address them? So some of the important <coughs> restoration questions that I, I know you're all dealing with are, what are the potential impacts of wetlands and barrier beach island reconstruction on, on these habitats, which, which are the most cost effective? How much protection for intact components should there be? as opposed to the ones that are highly degraded. And that's a balancing issue of making sure that we preserve what we've got in, in addition to um, uh, upgrading the, the highly degraded ones. What's the effectiveness, uh, as I said before, of nitrogen abatement strategies and the interaction with sediment strategies? Uh, the, Im the impact of compensatory recovery, uh, mangroves and, and perhaps the marine protected areas. Uh, the impacts of, of the oil spill. What's the pace of recovery? And this is certainly a lot of the science I just discussed about before. How do fishery management policies, uh, for example, through the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council interact with your activities and, and what's the connection? And how do we establish specific restoration targets? Now, in terms of measuring the uh, impacts of all the restoration activities that you have ongoing, 
uh, there's a lot of discussion about proper metrics to do this, and I know your scientific committee has been working on that. Try this again. There we go. Okay, so how should we measure the impacts of um, all the restoration activities? What metrics should you use? And how do they relate to both the existing set of environmental measurements and what new measurements should we take? Um, there are a lot of candidate metrics that you all could use. Uh, for example, the change in wetland size and habitat quality, the size and intensity of the dead zones that form each year off Louisiana and Texas, the population size, disease prevalence, and yields of fishery populations, et cetera. Um, all of these need to be carefully thought through as you do your activities. Um, the last part uh, I want to emphasize is that part of um, our activities should also be devoted to improving our skill at actually forecasting the types of things that we do, and, and we consider that a metric as well. Uh, in summary, a, a number of things. First of all, Florida's ocean coastal resources are vital to the Gulf of Mexico large marine ecosystem, and there's enormous economic dependency here. Um, just to back up what Mimi said, 40% of recreational marine fishing in the United States occurs in Florida. It's about a $9 billion a year industry, and as well about a $5 billion commercial fishing industry. Um, the, the scientists, the collected scientists in Florida really appreciate the Restoration Task Force um, coming down to have that meeting and to, for reaching out to the region scientists to um, be part of this activity and to have some, some impact on, on your thinking. We need to work on our collaborative mechanisms. I think uh, the Deepwater Horizon incident um, kind of showed where we needed to do some more homework in terms of uh, interactions between the academic side and the state and federal governments. And I think we can take that as an opportunity to improve. And last, we need to harmonize all these science activities that we've got ongoing. It makes no sense for us to pay for the same thing twice. And I think um, um, if we can get the Gulf Research Collaborative and other, other groups together um, and trying to look at uh, through the lens of restoration activities, we'll be in good shape. Thank you. Thank you. Um, me, Dr. Morosky, before you, uh, Dr. Steve. Dr. I just want to give the uh, task force members a chance to ask you any questions. First, I, I want to thank you for um, a wonderful presentation and also for your extraordinary service during the oil spill and all the hard work you did. Um, I'll, I'll save my questions and see if any of the task force members have any questions. Please yeah, stop. Steve, I, I want to commend you as well as the administrator did on your great work. By the way, uh, the National Marine Fishery Service is a part of NOAA, in case some of you are wondering, and Steve was, was really our point person down in the Gulf regarding science last year, and I want to commend you again publicly, publicly for those efforts. However, I want to ask a question, and you know, as you pointed out here in closing, one of the things we learned that we needed to get better at, and I pointed this out at the International Oil Spill Conference in Portland, Oregon a week ago, uh, that this, uh, Coordination internally is great. The coordination within agencies and across all agencies is, is important. How we work with the trustees in this formal process is important. But, but what we need to get better at is how we coordinate with uh, the academic community and the NGO communities. And, and I was just wondering, since you've now been hmm. in the academic community for a few months now, <laughs> did you have any additional insights on that that you, you didn't <clears throat> see while you were in your job as a chief scientist in the, in the federal community? Well, I, I guess uh, my first insight would be um, that it's uh, certainly difficult to sit in somebody else's shoes, and, and I'm, I'm learning that. Uh, I do think that uh, early and often, you know, coordination, it, there's, there's just no um, alternative to making sure that we have that coordination. I thought the meeting that uh, John Hankinson ran at USF was <coughs> immensely important because it gave a voice to Groups you don't normally think about, you know, uh, science groups. And a lot of people don't think of scientists as stakeholders in this uh, regime, but, but really they can be your best friend or your worst enemy. And, and I think, you know, um, a higher level of coordination, interaction with the, the region scientists um, is important. And also I think uh, sorting through the, the, you know, all of the opportunities for funding and, and, and coordination for things like the observing system. Mm -hmm. and, and I think having the, the the commission articulate some of the scientists' priorities, I think would be very important in your final report. Okay, thank you. And I was actually gonna ask, um, and maybe too soon as well, or you just may know from your past life, but 
I couldn't agree more that metrics is a really important thing for this group to put forward in its um, recommendations. And we may not have them all right away, but you, um, in your recommendations, give some good ones as well as in the course of the presentation. Do, do, is there a place where that already exists? Um, you mentioned the Chesapeake Bay, obviously based at all the work we're doing so that the public can go somewhere and say, how healthy is the bay? Well, how healthy is the Gulf and where would that place be? We don't want to recreate the wheel if it's out there. Well, there's an axiom uh, in my former job was the cheapest data we'll ever collect is the stuff we already have. <laughs> and we have a tremendous amount of data, but it's not in a place where people can see it. Uh, a lot of times data are scientifically <clears throat> difficult to understand, and so we need metrics that summarize these data. People are very map-oriented these days, and we need to have all those things. There are some very good starts. I think uh, um, as a part of Deepwater Horizon, there was, uh, you know, re RestoreTheGulf.gov and others. You know, they, they, have, they have given a good benchmark, I think, but we need to have this bifurcated a little bit. We need uh, some sort of you know, visually appealing, public-oriented graphics, but we also need places where the you know scientists can get at the data. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think uh, uh, we need to do both of those well. We're, we have a good start, but we haven't really we don't have that sort of turnkey you know integration of the data that we could make metrics from yet. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Morris. Thank you, Dr. Morosky. As you all can tell, we've asked our speakers to compress a whole lot of really good information into a short period of time. So maybe if you have questions, you, I'm sure you can reach out to Dr. Morosky and, and follow up on some of the things he presented. Our next speaker is Dr. Richard Harper. Dr. Harper is the Executive Director of the Office of Economic Development and Engagement at the University of West Florida here in Pensacola. Dr. Harper has been instrumental in providing technical assistance to small business and has been particularly helpful in developing an understanding of the impact of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill to the Gulf. Dr. Harper holds a Bachelor of Arts in Business from Guilford College, a Master of Science, and a PhD from Duke University in Business. Dr. Harper is going to discuss the economic benefits of the Gulf to Florida. Madam Administrator, Chairman Hankinson, members of the task force. Just tell me the next slide. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for having me here today, uh, members of the audience as well. Uh, as Mimi mentioned, I'd like to talk uh, about the uh, economic importance of the Gulf. And so I'd like to show you some slides uh, across the U.S. Gulf states of population, population growth uh, that's projected over the coming years, as well as statistics on fisheries characteristics of the economy, uh, the dependence of Florida on, on the, the Gulf assets, uh, particularly in the tourism area. And then I'd like to shift gears and, and look uh, generally at damages uh, from the spill and then uh, take it local so that we can see actually uh, what these amenities mean to uh, Northwest uh, Florida and to Florida in general. Uh, next slide. To begin with, here are the counties that I'll be talking about in Florida. You can see uh, that's about, as the crow flies, about 650 miles uh, of coastline. Next slide. Uh, and, and here are the uh, other four uh, Gulf states in the U.S. Uh, Texas, what, about 450 miles of coastline. Mississippi, uh, uh, Alabama, a little less. Louisiana, more. Uh, and in looking at population across the Gulf states, uh, these are the, the uh, counties that we'll be looking at. Next slide, please. Uh, it's important to recognize that uh, Florida is really the hub, hub of Latin American commerce. Um, we have close relationships uh, via trade with the nations of the Caribbean and Latin America. In fact, we're closer to 16 capitals uh, than we are to Washington, D.C. Uh, in Miami. <coughs> As you can see, the population of the U.S. is moving uh, south and to the coast. So that's a 400-year trend for the United States. And this is picked up on the Gulf Coast by seeing that uh, population on the Gulf Coast, which was almost 2% of U.S. population uh, in 1950, has increased to uh, almost 2.8% of population in 2000. And if you look at the Gulf Coast of Florida, it's growing rapidly relative to the rest of the state, which traditionally has been a fast growth state. Next slide, please. In fact, if you look at total numbers of population in those shaded counties that I showed you earlier, 
you can see that the population of Florida that lives in coastal counties immediately on the Gulf is almost six million people, by far the largest population of the U.S. states around the Gulf. Next slide, please. And then if you look at the growth that's projected for these counties that are on the Gulf, you can see that Florida has a projected population growth over the five-year period, 2010 to 2015, of about 250,000 people who are drawn by the economic, the cultural, and the natural resource amenities of the Gulf. Next slide, please. And if we turn to the economic importance of those amenities, the first slide here is uh, commercial fisheries. And what we can see from the 2008 NOAA report is that the west coast of Florida is about 5.7 uh, billion dollars in uh, economic activity and measured by final sales. That's roughly half of the dollar value of uh, output from uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Next slide, please. And then if we look at recreational fisheries, we can see that, uh, that at $5.6 billion, again, about half of all the economic value, uh, three-fifths of all the trips, uh, the recreational fishing trips that are taken, originate in Florida, so it's a huge amenity for Florida residents. Next slide, please. Then if we look across the states, uh, this, uh, what I've done here in this slide is uh, set the national average equal to the vertical line, which you can imagine, uh, running uh, up the left-hand side of that bar graph. And if a state has a greater than national average density of employment, then in a particular sector, then the bar extends to the right. And as you can see, I've mapped two sectors here. Uh, one is resource extraction. And we can see that uh, in Texas, Louisiana, there's a heavy weight on resource extraction. Those bars extend to the right, the red bars do. Whereas in three other states, uh, the weight on resource extraction is relatively low compared to the national average density. What you can see is that Mississippi is much lower than the national average density in, natural, in resource extraction, oil and gas, uh, other um, fuel resources, and you can see that Florida is also lower and Alabama is lower. But when you turn to arts, entertainment, recreation, accommodations, food service, the sectors that we normally think of as being the most uh, representative of the tourism sector, you can see that the picture changes drastically. Um, Mississippi, the Gulf Coast of Mississippi with its casino activity is heavily invested in employment in uh, the tourism sector. And then of course Florida has a high share of its employment in the tourism sector relative to the other Gulf states. Next slide please. And then uh, this, this graph should actually be uh, uh, projected much larger. But what you can see here is I've, I've taken the uh, counties which uh, had um, disproportionate <coughs> impact directly from the oil spill and mapped out what they look like relative to the national average employment density in the tourism sectors. And so what we can see, if you look at the vertical line uh, at 100 percent, that's the U.S. average, and you can see that counties in Texas are slightly less intense than the national average in, in uh, tourism-related employment. Then if you bump down a couple of counties, you can see the Mississippi counties, uh, which due to casino activities are heavily engaged in tourism activity. Then in Louisiana, the share decreases, uh, which is relatively less employment in uh, retail, arts, recreation, accommodation, food service as a share of the national average. And then in the uh, counties which are closer to the bottom, well, the bottom two counties are actually Alabama, and uh, you can see that Baldwin County, Alabama, is heavily invested in the tourism sector. But realize that of the seven westernmost counties in Florida, um, every one of them has a greater than national employment density in tourism-related sectors. Next slide, please. If we then look at uh, the cumulative state tax revenue that has flowed from oil and gas production, you can see the same sort of story. From fiscal year 2000 to fiscal year 2009, Florida is a state that does not um, get significant revenues from oil and gas production. It's the lowest of all five of the states, whereas if you look at Louisiana, Texas, these are the states that um, get relatively more severance fee revenue, um, over six billion for Louisiana, 22 billion for Texas uh, from oil and gas uh, production. 
Next slide, please. And here we have a, a quick look at uh, the claims that were made to the Gulf Coast Claims Facility. These are current as of uh, several days ago. And if you look at the total payments uh, that Mr. Feinberg's facility has made, which I would argue are a much less than complete representation of the damages, economic damages attributable to the spill, because they focus uh, disproportionately only on kind of the first tier businesses uh, in tourism and on the beach. And uh, you know, when 25% when of your overall economy in Bay County, Florida is attributable to tourism activity, rising to 40% in the summer, that means that industries in the second tier, the ones who supply the tourism industries, are also strongly affected. But if we simply look at the Feinberg figures here, of the 4.2 billion that had been paid out, as of uh, this past weekend, we see that Florida accounts for 1.7 billion of that, Louisiana 1.4, uh, and so forth. Next slide, please. And here's what tourism means. This is a photo actually uh, from this past weekend of what Memorial Day looks like at Pensacola Beach, a major holiday. Realize that uh, according to Visit Florida statistics, uh, spending per party per day uh, in 2007 was $378 per party per day. Think about how many visiting parties there are uh, in all those tourists uh, who are on our beaches. And so that's Memorial Day weekend 2011. Uh, we say thank goodness that the American tourist has a consumer has a relatively short memory. The beaches were packed in uh, Memorial Day. But then contrast that to the next slide, please. This was the 4th of July, uh, taken from Pensacola Beach. Uh, that, that beach should have been jam-packed full. Every one of those visiting parties who would have been spending $378 per party per day that we saw on Memorial Day 2011, the beach is empty on the 4th of July, which was a weekend, it was a Sunday, and so this is at the root of the economic damages that accrue to Florida because it's about perceptions. It's about perceptions of the cleanliness of the beach asset, the quality of the seafood, the amenities that visitors expect. And when they make their travel plans uh, six weeks, eight, eight weeks in advance, it's tough to plan for damage to specific locations in the Gulf. Next slide, please. And then in this slide, we look at the disproportionately oil-affected counties in northwest Florida. And Florida is the bottom bar on the graph uh, there. That's how, that's the intensity of employment in tourism in Florida, which is the most tourist-intensive state in the nation. But what we can see is that for the, the northwest Florida counties, each one of them has a greater density of employment in the tourism sector than does Florida as a whole. Why is this important? Next slide, please. Well, this matters because um, in this part of the state, we have the highest share of visitors who say that what they do is uh, beachfront, waterfront oriented. 52% of visitors list the beach as their top activity. And if you look across Florida, across the eight tourism regions where beach activities are important, this is the one that has the greatest share of beach visitors. Uh, that doesn't mean it's the redheaded stepchild in terms of uh, dollar value spending. We rank fourth out of the eight uh, regions in per person per day spending, and there's that $378 per day figure. And it's largely a drive to destination. Visitors come from around the southeast. Next slide, please. And so what that means for our region is that there's a huge amount of seasonality. If you look, for example, at uh, uh, bed tax revenues, uh, these figures are actually for Panama City, and they show overall tourism intensity uh, by month for the uh, 12 months of the year. And what you see, if you took um, $1,200, uh, $100 a month, and apply that according to the pattern of visitor spending in Panama City, you see that uh, during the summer months, visitors would actually be spending about $180 per month. Uh, and that during the winter months, they'd be spending much less. That's what's true of Climate Zone 8. If we look more locally at Pensacola, what we would see is that uh, bed tax revenues in January, the beach areas are about 35% of county revenues, and that rises to about 70% during the summer. So it's a highly seasonal economy. Next slide, please. And so here's a picture of that seasonality over time. You can see that year, summer of 2005, the aftermath of Hurricane Ivan, where uh, due to debt, damage and destruction of beachfront inventory. We really missed that summer season. I have not drawn summer 2010 in here, but summer 2010, due to the effects of the oil spill, um, it was uh, kind of like January and July. So, uh, next slide. 
So that's uh, uh, my prepared remarks on uh, the importance of uh, the, the Gulf amenity. I have not touched on uh, the military amenities and importance of the Gulf ranges, which Colonel McPherson uh, will do shortly. Um, but I'd be happy to take your, your questions. <clears throat> Questions from the task force members? Okay. Thank, thank, you, very thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank you, Dr. Harper. That was fascinating. And speaking, coming from me, who isn't really an economist, I meant that. <laughs> um, my, my, my good friend, Mr. Nick Wiley, is our next speaker. Mr. Wiley is the executive director of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Nick has over 25 years of professional experience in fish and wildlife management and has served in a leadership capacity within the commission for many of those years. DEP has worked closely with Nick and the commission during the oil spill, and we continue to have a great relationship as we move into restoration. Mr. Wiley is going to address the importance of the Gulf to the fish and wildlife resources of Florida. Thank you, Mimi. Administrator Jackson, Administrator Keyes Fleming, uh, Director Higginson, and all the distinguished members of the task force. First, thank you for your service. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is really important to us, and, and we really appreciate all the good work you're doing. Also, I want to thank Pensacola. I recently read the new slogan in Pensacola is there's lots to love in Pensacola, and I agree wholeheartedly with that. Um, I also want to note that I work for a commission appointed by the governor, and one of my commissioners has joined me today, Ken Wright, in the front row. Thank you, commissioner, for being a part of this and helping us. And thank you for this opportunity to showcase the amazing diversity of fish and wildlife supported by and dependent upon a healthy Gulf of Mexico. It's pretty obvious in Florida, as with all the states in, in the Gulf Coast, that our coastal communities are central to our way of life, where we work, eat, sleep, and recreate. Our lives and livelihoods are truly intertwined and inseparable from our abundant and diverse fish and wildlife resources in the Gulf. Our fish and wildlife resources across the Gulf are so rich and diverse, I can't possibly cover it all in this presentation, but I'm going to do my best to give you a taste. First, uh, you've heard a lot already about uh, the importance and richness of the Gulf of Mexico. It truly is one of the most productive ecosystems in the world. I know you've heard that, but I can't state the importance of that. This productivity is fed by nutrient-rich waters entering from the Caribbean through the Yucatan Straits and from river runoff, particularly the Mississippi and Atchafalaya Basin. Uh, which is really notable now with all the water coming down the Mississippi. 90% uh, of the fresh water entering the Gulf is from the Mississippi River. Um, the Gulf supports more than 500 species of fish, five species of sea turtles, 29 species of marine mammals, dozens of resident and migratory bird species, and many coastal dependent mammals and reptiles. The productivity in the Gulf fuels a tremendous economic engine for tourism. You just heard how important that is. Uh, particularly with fisheries and many other sectors. Uh, in fact, the Gulf of Mexico yields more fin fish. Now, now get this. The Gulf of Mexico yields more fin fish, shrimp, and shellfish annually than the South and Mid-Atlantic, Chesapeake, and New England areas combined. So uh, there is lots to love in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the Gulf region is blessed with some of the most unique and spectacular natural areas in the country, including extensive salt marshes, lush seagrass meadows, mangrove forests, and the only tropical coral reef system in the continental United States. The Gulf's barrier islands and coastal wetlands provide invaluable storm protection to our coastal areas and reduce the likelihood of storm surge and flooding. It all starts with habitat. One of the most important characteristics accounting for the Gulf's productivity and diversity is this complex interchange between inshore and offshore habitats. That's what makes wildlife, that's what makes fish. More than 80% of Florida's recreational and commercially important fish species are dependent on seagrass beds at some point in their life. That's why you hear a lot of emphasis on restoration and looking at seagrass beds. This unique combination of suitable substrate and the right mix of fresh and salt water also supports, and I'm getting everybody ready for lunch, a multi-million dollar oyster fishery in the Florida Panhandle. Oysters in Apalachicola Bay grow to marketable size faster than in any other area of the United States. 
Uh, but we also recognize there's a lot of great seafood from our other Gulf states, too. I don't want to sound too Florida-centric, but we are proud of what we have in Florida. Um, there are nearly 500,000 acres of salt marsh in coastal Florida. In addition to providing valuable filtering capacity for improved water quality and storm protection, these habitats support a wide diversity of fish, mammal, bird, and reptile species, over 80 species total. Also, don't forget our coral reefs down in the south part of the Gulf in the Florida Keys. They're well known for their biodiversity, and that's also a key economic engine for Florida. In fact, the estimated asset value of the coral reefs in the Keys are over $7.6 billion. The Gulf Coast is crucial to sustaining abundant and diverse bird life. <coughs> Uh, this is the eye candy part of my presentation for those of you who love birds, and, and I'm a bird lover myself. Coastal habitats provide key wintering, nesting, and foraging areas for a huge variety of bird species, including shorebirds like plovers, sandpipers, pelicans, and gulls, ocean-going pelagic birds such as gannets, petrels, and terns, wading birds like herons and egrets, majestic birds of prey like the osprey and bald eagle, and a number of waterfowl, waterfowl species including redhead ducks and skull. During the spring and fall migration, coastal areas along the Gulf provide critical stopover habitat for migrating warblers and other songbirds making their way from Canada and northern states to Central and South America. We're also <coughs> mindful that birds greatly enrich the coastal experience for human visitors we call tourists. Bird watching is a major economic engine from Florida. A lot of people don't realize that. Bird watching and wildlife viewing bring in over $5.6 in economic benefits to the state each year. I want to highlight a couple of the superstars of the birding world in Florida and why also to illustrate how important the Gulf Coast is to these bird species. The American oyster catcher, a bird after my own heart. I love oysters too. This bird is dependent on healthy oyster reef habitat. Over 90% of that remaining habitat is in the, on the Gulf Coast and in Florida. So it's really crucial to su sustaining these national treasures that migrate. And speaking of migration, we have one of the world champions in migration in my next slide, the red knot. This species is the ultimate snowbird in Florida. We have a lot of snowbirds, but this one gets the award for traveling over 9,000 miles from the Arctic just to come down and spend the winter on the beautiful Gulf beaches. This is where they, they live their life in that part of the, that time of the year. They roost, they forage, and without healthy beaches and that, that ecosystem, in the, in the intertidal zones, uh, we wouldn't be able to provide a home for red knights. And actually, this species is in trouble, and is, 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 we need to give it a lot of attention to make sure we don't lose it. Now we're going to go to some of the more well-known species that, that people that come to the coast often hope to see. In Florida, we, uh, we have five species of sea turtles that visit Florida, and most of these nest on Florida beaches. And uh, the, the, the most common by far is the loggerhead. Many people come to Florida and delight in seeing sea turtles come ashore and nest on our beaches. Uh, we, we also have some wonderful uh, marine mammals, uh, dolphins, uh, manatees, very popular in Florida. And so we're, we're really uh, proud to have these icons of the, the reptilian and sea mammal world that, that live in Florida and people come enjoy. I do want to highlight one thing that happened that was really, uh, we got out of the box last year when we were trying to uh, get ahead of the impacts of the oil spill. And this was, uh, this was one that got a lot of attention. It was a result of a great partnership between our federal partners, uh, our state partners, all the states in the Gulf area. We came together and said, okay, we don't want to risk losing an entire season of hatchlings if the spill it continues to expand into the, into the eastern Gulf. So the decision was made, and not an easy decision, to, to dig up and move and relocate nests from the Gulf to the Atlantic coast. We moved them over to Cape Canaveral, Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. They were hatched out over on Merritt Island at the Kennedy Space Center. We got some help from NASA too. Federal Express joined in to move them across the state. It was a great partnership, and as a result, we saved 7,000 hatchlings and released them in the Atlantic and had like a 90% hatching rate. It was unreal how successful it was. The downside is we're not sure if those hatchlings are going to come back to the Gulf Coast or they're going to come back to the Atlantic Coast. Um, but either way, we still have plenty of hatchlings out there to supplement and, and keep our, our sea turtle population uh, uh, growing. 
Now to the kind of what we call the rock stars of the, the Gulf Coast, because people come to Florida to catch red snapper, or to catch redfish, or to catch grouper, and they also come to eat them. Uh, they want to see them in the restaurants, on the menu. Uh, I want to talk about these. these uh, we view these as our hidden treasures beneath the waves. Uh, these are truly kind of the crown jewels of the marine ecosystem. They're the top game species, game fish species that, that we hear about. But I also want to note that these are just kind of the top layer. They're, there's such a diversity of fish life in the Gulf, in our reef systems, in our estuaries. Everywhere you go, we've just got diversities in fisheries. And uh, we, want to, we want to just highlight the fact that we can't have that without maintaining a healthy and properly functioning ecosystem across all those habitats that result in putting uh, grouper and snapper on the table. I want to talk about what's at stake if we aren't successful in restoring our fisheries and maintaining healthy, stable fisheries in Florida, which is an ongoing fight for us. Uh, in Florida, we have more saltwater anglers than any other state. Uh, over 14 million fishing trips were recorded in the Gulf of Mexico last year. We have a robust charter industry and there's a direct connection to our shore-based infrastructure, the marinas, uh, the, the bait and tackle shops, the places that facilitate our fishing businesses are so critical. I'm going to break it up into two categories. You've got your offshore fish, red snapper, grouper, amberjack. People love to come to Florida to catch these fish. Uh, we then also are blessed to have wonderful inshore fishing, inshore game fish. Next slide, please. Well, I want to highlight one that people don't hear much about, the bay scallop. In Florida, people love to go scalloping. That's what they call it. They go out, they snorkel around in the grass beds, they pick up scallops. It's like an Easter egg hunt in the ocean. Mm. And bay scallops are delicious. Uh, I encourage you to order those on the menu if you can. But our season opens up in a few weeks in Florida. Very popular, uh, kind of a Florida special kind of activity. Now a little bit about trends. We, we saw, we've been seeing a, a real increase in fishing effort in Florida. And that brings good news and challenges. You know, it makes, puts more pressure on sustaining healthy fisheries. But it also uh, helps us, you know, helps us bring more people to Florida for visiting for economic benefits. Uh, you'll note at the end of this graph that we see a little nosedive. That's, that's a, because of the, the oil spill, the impacts, and we're really hoping, on a, hoping for a fast recovery. And those snapshots of Panama City Beach on Memorial Day weekend last weekend are encouraging. Back to economic impacts again. Uh, you've heard a lot of this, but when you roll up all the fishing uh, boating, wildlife viewing impacts to the state of Florida, you're talking almost $30 billion in impact and over 300,000 jobs. That's statewide. Now this, we're back to just the Gulf Coast again, saltwater fishing economic impacts. These are uh, showing you how the impacts have been on the increase. And that's a chart you won't see in a lot of economic circles for anything else because of the recession we've been through, but fishing has been, has held its own even during a recession, but now we're seeing things level off. We hope we can get to a recovery point and see things continue to increase and see us uh, continue to reap the benefits of fishing in Florida. And, and let's not forget our important, valuable, critical commercial fishing industry too. The, these are the folks that put shrimp and grouper and snapper and lobster on the table for the restaurants in Florida, for the tourists in Florida and for just the folks that want to go out and have a, have a seafood dinner. Our commercial fishing industry is crucial to our state and crucial to providing jobs. As you see, over 100,000 jobs are dependent on our seafood industry. And we're watching really closely. Uh, we are testing seafood. We're testing our fisheries. We're doing everything in our power to make sure we continue to ensure fishing, uh, that our seafood is safe in Florida, and we continue to get that message out, but we also want to continue to be vigilant about testing and making sure we can continue to make that guarantee. And I'm going to leave you with a new, emerging, exciting idea. We've been working with our friends in Pensacola and, uh, and our friends in Louisiana and uh, other, other partners and friends across the state and the Gulf. We are working hard to develop a network of fish hatcheries, saltwater fish hatcheries. And it's, it's a relatively new and emerging technology, but we have worked hard to figure out
how to grow saltwater species in hatcheries that can replenish our stocks and help sustain all those fisheries that we're so dependent upon uh, in Florida and in the Gulf Coast. We're excited about this hatchery program. We're hoping we can find a way to link it to some of the key restoration initiatives that we're looking at. And uh, we want to continue to talk about this and, uh, and highlight the fact that this is one way we believe we, along with restoring and recovering habitats, we believe this is one way we can quickly replenish and offset any damages that occurred from the oil spill. So we're really hopeful that we'll get a lot of interest and excitement stirred up about saltwater marine fisheries hatcheries along the coast, and we hope to have one in Pensacola someday soon. And with that, I welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Director Wiley. First to uh, my fellow task force members, any questions? I had, I had one up with me. This was actually something that, that um, Steve Morosky brought up, but I'm concerned about that, 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 that seagrass loss in the, uh, in the Big Bend. I was actually shocked by that, but um, maybe I have to get Steve back up too. But what, I'm sure you know some sense of what's going, going on there. I still think of that as sort of such a pristine sort of area to see that amount of seagrass. <coughs> I know there's some, some industrial issues on one of the rivers I worked on when I was in Region 4, but is that the only, the only thing going on there? Well, as far as cause, I really don't, I can't tell you all the factors. We're, we're working closely, mostly focused on restoration efforts and we're working closely with our partners at DEP. Um, but that's one of those, the key priorities for us to try to recover some of those seagrass beds out there. And we're actually getting close to developing some restoration techniques that are showing promise. So um, it's, it's something we've got to keep a close eye on. Your very important point. That is an incredible place. Anybody have, many of you probably haven't been there because people don't go there with regular, regular uh, course of business, but it is one of the most fantastic natural areas in Florida that people know a little about. That's so, right. <laughs> yeah, John, I noticed on one of the slides previously that uh, in Franklin County, one of those very sensitive areas, but development was on the rise there. I happen to know a little bit more about that since we studied it for the past 10 years, but that was, that's one of the True. factors I think that's taking place up in the Panhandle. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, um, and thanks for your presentation and for your enthusiasm for this work. It's really impressive and reassuring. Um, my question is this, and I'm wishing I'd ask your fellow presenters this. I mean, based on you know what you know, looking at this task force and who's here, from Florida's perspective, what are the top three things that you would have this group focus on that would really be most important to Florida? Um, great question, and uh, again, we've already hit on it. Restoring and recovering some of the, the coastal, the seagrass habitat areas. Uh, working from the beach out into those key habitat zones are, are what we'd like to do. You know, the, the beach areas are critical for, you know, beach rack. A lot of people don't know what rack is, but it's habitat for shorebirds along the beach. Restoring some of those habitats that were <laughs> clearly were damaged by by, by more by the response to the spill than anything. Uh, recovering some of those seagrass beds, salt marsh, and oyster beds. Those are all kind of interconnected, but those are key areas that we need to look at recovering. And we also believe, coupled with that, finding ways like this hatchery initiative to jumpstart recovery of our fisheries uh, from the other end. So we feel like we need to work from the habitat side and the, and the replenishment side. And we can, those are kind of the things that are key to us from a, from a fish and wildlife perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Our next speaker is Colonel Warren McPherson, who's a retired colonel from the U.S. Marine Corps. Rocky, as his friends call him, is currently serving as the director of the Military and Defense Programs in Enterprise Florida, which is a public-private agency responsible for economic development initiatives in Florida. Rocky is a Vietnam vet who served in combat both as an infantry officer and a naval aid aviator. Who better to talk to us about the importance of the Gulf to the military operations in Florida? Thank you, Mamie. Madam Chairman and members of the task force, good morning. Um, again, uh, thank you to Pensacola for welcoming us, but my reason for, for stating that is a little more personal. Uh, my son just spent 18 months here in naval aviation training and is now a marine helicopter pilot, well-trained in Afghanistan. 
So it's personal for me to be here in support of him and everything you're doing. And I'd like to take a few minutes to talk to you a little bit about the military in Florida, a little bit about what's here, why it's here, and why it's important, and why the Gulf is important to the military in, in Florida. Next slide, please. Now, we've looked at uh, other states across, uh, across, the, uh, across the Gulf, and most of the made states have one or two military bases. In the state of Florida, there are 20 major military installations. We have three unified commands here, two at MacDill, United States Central Command, which is the command location for the entire United States war effort in the Middle East, Afghanistan and Iraq. We have United States Special Operations Command, headquartered at MacDill, which runs the worldwide war on, from a special operations point of view around the globe. And we have United States Southern Command, located in Doral, which works all of the military operations and civil military programs for nations with our military in Central America and South America, essentially the southern part of the Western Hemisphere. We have eight Air Force bases of those 20, 10 Navy and Marine Corps bases and stations, and we have Camp Blanding, the headquarters of the Florida National Guard. Now, the Florida Guard is an integral part of everything military in Florida besides the federal installations. We have over 12,000 Florida Guardsmen. Most of them have been to Afghanistan or Iraq more than once, and they are the nucleus of what happens in Florida when we launch recovery efforts when any time we have natural disasters, hurricanes, or tornadoes, or anything of that like. So all of that is a huge military presence in our state. Next slide, please. This is a graphic depiction of where they all are, and you can see that nine of them are located on that 650 miles of coastline that Dr. Harper talked about from Pensacola all the way down to Key West. Uh, primarily in Florida, the focus of the military is Navy and Air Force. Next slide, please. <coughs> Now, why is the military in Florida in such a vast quantity? And the reason is, is very simple. Uh, it goes all the way back to World War II and even before that. But the land, the sea and the air, the training environment and the areas to do military training are just optimum here in Florida. We have excellent weather. If you're, you're an aviator, when you can fly more than 300 days of every year without weather interfering with your operations, that's a reason to have aviation training based here. And it has been here now, uh, Naval Aviation 2011 is the 100th year of Naval Aviation. They're celebrating their centennial uh, across the nation and here in Pensacola. Right. But rural terrain, uh, accessible terrain, particularly right after World War II, at the end of World War II, there were 170 small military bases and stations around the state of Florida. And uh, many of them uh, were training soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, but they also operated prisoner of war camps, and they manned coastal warning stations throughout the state. So from a base of, at the right end of World War II, 170, we have 20 major installations now, but three of the nine major commands of the United States military forces in our state. Now, uh, there's another reason that's important here too, and it's the last bullet on this slide. Uh, one of the major, uh, our, well, let's go a different route. Uh, since related to oil spills, oil is the foundation of our economy. Uh, the choke point in the Middle East for oil is in the Persian Gulf, the Straits of Hormuz. Uh, in naval warfare, uh, the, the tactic for closing off any given choke point is usually mines. Uh, and that's important, it's very important, uh, because naval support activity Panama City has been, since the end of World War II, the center of development for anti-mine warfare for the United States. And it continues that way, and the reason it is there is because the Gulf of Mexico, particularly right off of Panama City, mirrors the terrain and, and all of the uh, uh, environmental, bathymetric, and seafloor conditions of the Persian Gulf. Every mine countermeasure tool of the United States military since World War II that addresses anti-mine warfare has been developed here and is dependent on the Gulf. Uh, the Gulf is truly a vital national asset from that point of view. Uh, we think a lot about aviation training, and I'll talk to a couple other things as well. But that's why the military has focused here and grown here and succeeded here. So the question is, what's the impact of that? Next slide, please. What's the impact of 20 bases, three major commands, uh, 
hundreds of thousands of military service members in our state. Uh, Dr. Harper's Haas Center uh, works with us about every two years to evaluate the economic impact of the state uh, of military and defense related spending on the state of Florida. Um, based on the latest report, and it was 2008 data, $58.1 billion was the, the 2008 actually documented uh, impact on the state of Florida projected right now to 2010 to be 64.8, almost $65 billion today. Uh, and that has not been markedly affected by the recession. Military and defense spending, because of the fact that we're in two wars, has stayed relatively stable. And those portions of it related to some of the missions I'll talk about in a second uh, have actually grown. But in addition to that, uh, this defense-related spending for both the bases and all the defense industries that support our bases in the state of Florida and our military service members and their families uh, correlate directly to over 686,000 jobs. And state and local tax revenues uh, that derive from defense-driven activities are estimated to be $1.26 billion. So if all that's there, what is it that it does? Let's talk just for a few minutes on the military missions in the state of Florida. What are the key ones? Uh, I already mentioned my uh, fondness for aviation and flight training, but aviation flight training from the point of view of naval aviation, from the point of view of some Air Force aviation that is going to be here when the F-35, the newest American fighter, uh, starts its international training base at Eglin, and the fact that all of the people, you know, it's not just the pilots that fly the airplanes. Somebody has to turn the wrenches to fix them. And all of those folks are trained uh, on most of the different types of airplane, both fixed wing and helicopter, uh, in aviation here in Florida in just uh, tremendous national programs that are vital. Eglin Air Force Base is the largest military base in the United States. Uh, it is the key site for weapons development, weapons testing, and training for the Air Force regarding all of the new capabilities uh, that our nation has to allow our warriors to fight and win. <laughs> One that we don't talk a lot about is special operations training, but that's also centered. We mentioned earlier that Special Operations Command is centered at MacDill Air Force Base, their, their national command, but Air, AFSOC, Air Force Special Operations Training, their headquarters is at Hurlburt Field. Uh, they are the folks that fly what we've seen in the news recently as unique helicopters. Uh, and I won't go any further than that, but those originate from Hurlburt Field. Uh, the people that fly them and the, and the Air Force members who man them. And we've talked just a little bit about undersea uh, weapons delivery in the anti-mine capability, but everything that the United States does regarding undersea operations, delivery of SEALs, anti-mine measures, all of those kinds of uh, under the waves development and testing also occurs here in Florida. And then lastly, the Gulf is a tremendous site for military, joint military training of uh, multiple services in a variety of different ways. So those are the key missions that are here. There are others, but uh, for an overview at this level, those are ones that are critical to Florida. Next slide, please. Now, the Gulf Ranges, the white outline on this particular shine shows the boundaries of the Gulf Test Ranges. Column on the left, which I won't go through because the acronyms, I, I couldn't even get them all right myself, but they, that's a list of about 20 different weapon systems that since World War II have been developed and tested at Eglin, both at Eglin Air Force Base proper on their ranges and in the Gulf Test Range. The center area lists some of the more important ones there, uh, the uh, various uh, missiles and things that are key to technology today. But the column on the right is one I'd like to talk to just a little bit, and it's about the future. Um, as we develop better airplanes and better weapon systems, uh, the the mechanics of how all that operates, the physics of it, change as things get faster. We are developing hypersonic weapons, directed energy weapons, uh, and unmanned systems, <coughs> all of which uh, require a, an area and a space to be tested and developed. And the Gulf Test Range does that. Next slide, please. This shows some of those missions of, you know, AV, you, uh, our fish and wildlife experts just talked about birds and fish. Well, from a pilot point of view, these are birds as well, and they fly, and uh, we love them. But the, uh, the weapon systems that are used in the Gulf Ranges, uh, the variety of things from air-to-air -air weapons, <coughs> air-to-surface weapons, 
uh, surf missiles from ships, cruise missiles, and in the center top there, precision weapons that land exactly where you put them. All of those things are tested and developed in the Gulf Ranges. Next slide, please. These are some of the footprints that show how a various uh, types, particular type of weapon, the area that it takes to conduct safe testing operations around uh, any of these particular weapons, uh, whether they're bombs or rockets or missiles. But you can see, in order to do it safely, you have to have a place where you can isolate yourself, isolate the scenario, and control it in order to do accurate and testing and to do it safely. Next slide, please. This slide shows the Gulf Ranges compared to other test ranges in the United States. Uh, testing in Washington State, Utah, California, uh, and Nevada. All of those, each of those small golden segments represent in proportional scale a testing range in the western United States. And they all fit uh, with a lot of room into the Gulf Ranges. There's a tremendous uh, amount of capability in our range uh, that we have here. It's just absolutely critical that we maintain it and protect it. And this shows uh, why. Now, believe me, any of the, uh, the states that run testing operations out in the desert, for instance, at Nellis or Edwards, they would love to have some of the business that goes on here. We want to keep it in Florida. One more slide just to talk about test ranges. And I mentioned that Eglin is the largest uh, base in the United States, largest military base in the United States. Uh, the red on this slide shows major testing areas. A uh, small block over to the left is Pensacola and Whiting Field just above that to the northeast. But the three county red area there are the boundaries of Eglin Air Force Base that includes everything from Santa Rosa over to Walden counties. And those three counties cooperate tremendously. And you extend down to the right, the red down to the right is Tyndall. Uh, that complex and right adjacent to it on the point of land is Naval Support Activity Panama City. This range of, from Pensacola to Tyndall of seven major installations that include not only operating bases but range capabilities uh, shows a tremendous amount of land-based ranges that exist in this state. But additionally, these lands are, are very much environmentally protected conservation areas as well. Uh, there are tremendous uh, partnerships between the military and organizations like the Nature Conservancy or others that partner to ensure that uh, we can protect not only the bases, but in some cases protect species or land as well by, by managing uh, with mutual goals uh, these areas that are both operational and sensitive in their environment. So uh, there's a great, uh, great partnership here that we want to continue. And finally, because of uh, all the things we've talked about, the fact that we have uh, great uh, facilities, we have the weather, the climate, the terrain, all of those things, uh, Florida continues to gain missions as well. In BRAC 2005, uh, new missions which have come to Florida and are, are here now, just, just arriving, the 7th Special Forces Group is an entire group of Special Forces soldiers oriented on South America that are moving into Eglin Air Force Base. There is an entire new cantonment there for Army cantonment for a Special Forces group that has been built, over $400 million of construction, and, and that will be a training base for these group of Special Operations Forces who focus on Central and South America. Mm -hmm. The F-35, our newest fighter, is going to be based, the initial training site will be at Eglin Air Force Base for not only United States training, but eight international companies <laughs> that are also buying this airplane, and then of course cruise missiles as well. Uh, Florida gained not only these missions because of all the things we've talked about about why the military is in Florida, but this resulted in an additional 4,000 jobs, high paying skilled jobs as well. So in summary, <coughs> I'd like to uh, talk just a little, just close with this. Um, with the $65 billion economic impact that I talked about, that's right up there with agriculture and tourism as the top three economic drivers in our state. Aviation training, weapons development, and undersea operations and training were affected by the Deepwater Horizon incident. The Gulf Ranges are the foundation of the military missions in Florida. At Governor Scott's very first meeting with base commanders uh, in the state, and he meets with all the commanders of these 20 installations every quarter personally. At the very first meeting, when he uh, just before he was inaugurated, uh, General Worcester, who is the head of uh, Air Force Special Operations Command made a statement that the Gulf Ranges are the goose that laid the golden egg. 
Uh, the, very, the golden eggs are the missions that are here in Florida on bases doing things that our military needs to be prepared to win. Without the Gulf Ranges, many of those missions would not be here. So it's vital that the Gulf recovery uh, be continued. We're, we're glad that this task force is working on the ways to keep <coughs> the Gulf of Mexico clean and, uh, and free and, and as the, the right uh, habitat, not only for all the things that have been talked about by other folks, but also because it's vital to be a part of our national defense capabilities uh, here in the state of Florida. And uh, we commend you for all the things you're doing and thank you very much for your time. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, it's also my understanding that, the, um, and I know that the Gulf of Mexico program is located at the Senate Center, and uh, that you have capacity that, that, that can be uh, partnered with the efforts to restore the Gulf in terms of, of a lot of the, uh, the work you do in your, in, in your Gulf work, uh, some very sophisticated scientific work, and I want to make sure we emphasize the partnership that, uh, that the military can bring, bring to those efforts as well. It does, sir, on a regular basis, and Florida has some very good programs to, uh, to jointly provide conservation dollars uh, along with things supporting our military bases, and, and they work hand in hand. Any other questions? If not, thank you so much, Colonel McPherson. Thank you. There it is. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Clyde Mathis. Mr. Mathis is the Port Director of the Port of Pensacola. He's a 30-year veteran of the maritime industry. Prior to accepting this position in August of 2006, Mr. Mathis was Executive Assistant for Marketing and Business Development for the Port of New Orleans. Mr. Mathis is going to take a few minutes to talk to us about the importance of Florida ports and obviously their relationship to the Gulf. Thank you, Mimi. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, as Mimi says, I have been in the port business for about 30 years, so I could talk for a long time, but uh, I was asked to keep things brief. I'm just going to hit on some of the biggest economic factors of Florida ports and, and concentrate a little bit on the Gulf ports. Ports are economic engines. Uh, the Florida Ports Council represents our 14 deep sea ports in Tallahassee. We have been for a long time trying to educate the public, our government leaders, and everyone on how much economic engines ports are. Uh, this past le legislative session, we were very successful. Uh, Governor Scott gets it, and he's moving forward and helping us. <coughs> Slide, please. Almost everything Floridians wear, eat, or use on a daily basis comes through the Florida seaports. We have, as I said, 14 uh, public seaports. Uh, the six that we are more concerned with today, St. Petersburg, Tampa, and Manatee in the Tampa area, and Pensacola, Panama City, and Port St. Joe in the Panhandle. Whoa. Excuse me. International trade moving through Florida seaports was valued at $69.7 billion in 2010. We accounted for nearly 52 or 55 percent of the state's total uh, 126 billion dollars in trade. Uh, this is the one, the factor that I really like to point out to everyone: 550,000 jobs with an annual average wage of 54,000 dollars plus. Uh, that is more than double the average wage of non-degree occupations, and over 15,000 more than the average annual wage for all occupations in the state of Florida. State and local revenues uh, for taxes, $1.7 billion and $66 billion in total economic value. Uh, Florida's cruise industry accounts for 59% of all U.S. cruise embarkations. And some notes here, uh, Tampa is the leader in the Gulf. Uh, they home port four vessels from three different cruise lines. In October of this year, they will add another vessel. Last year, they had over 800,000 passengers and their five-year out projection is over 1.1 million passengers. We rank fourth in exports throughout the state. Uh, most recent years, 100 to 120 billion dollars 
uh, value of goods traded through Florida seaports. Our Gulf Coast ports, as we mentioned before, Pensacola, Panama City, Port St. Joe, Tampa, and Manatee, 125,000 direct, direct and indirect jobs, $10.5 billion of economic activity annually. And there is a misprint on this slide. The uh, state and local tax revenues is $750 million, if y'all want to make that change. Uh, here in Pensacola, We've partnered, just to give you a little local flavor, we have partnered with General Electric's local production plant. Over the next several months, we will export over 400 nacelle generator units to build a wind energy farm in Brazil. And the mission statement of Florida Seaports, enhance the economic vitality and quality of life throughout the state by fostering the growth and domestic, growth in domestic and foreign waterborne commerce. And that concludes our brief presentation. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah. Uh, any questions for Mr. Matthews? <laughs> Madam Administrator, that concludes our presentation. I want to thank the audience for your patience, and I want to thank the task force for coming back to Florida and allowing us to have our chance to, to present these issues to you. Thank you. And we have one more presentation uh, before we move into the public listening sessions, and that's in recognition of the fact that um, Northwest Florida is important, but we have some other areas of Florida that are extremely important when we talk about ecosystem restoration and the Gulf. So we're going to hear now from Sher Shannon Estenis, Director of the Everglades Restoration Initiatives from uh, DOI. Good morning. I think it's still morning. Thank you, Madam Administrator, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the task force. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm going to try very hard to respect the time limit that I've been given and um, go through this quickly. Um, it, it's wonderful to be here to share with you sort of the work that we've been doing in the Everglades. And certainly when it comes to governance, you'll see a lot that's familiar. Uh, I am currently sort of acting as the executive director of the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force. And, um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then at, at the end, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a specific project that we're working on that is aimed specifically at restoration and building resiliency in, in our northwestern most uh, reaches of the Everglades, the Caloosahatchee Estuary, which is an important Gulf resource. So next slide. Okay, the picture on the left is obviously not a satellite image of 1850, but it's a satellite, it's an estimation of what the Everglades south of Lake Okeechobee probably looked like. I'm gonna spend three slides here just orienting you a little bit. Um, we think that this is probably what the Everglades looked like in 1850. Now with a couple of clicks of the arrow key or the mouse, I wanna show you here on the, on the right hand side, over the last hundred years, keep going, some of the infrastructure that's been put in place, this is a massively scaled flood protection infrastructure. The red lines are uh, channelized either natural rivers or new canals that have been, were cut in the last century to provide flood protection. If you'll keep clicking, you'll see, keep clicking, um, a huge system of, of levees that, and then I think one more click, well, completes it. And what you have there is the central and southern flood uh, control project and that infrastructure more so than railroads or highways that infrastructure has come to define what we know um, now as modern day South Florida where seven and a half million people reside which is roughly 40 percent of the state's population next slide please um, the Economic implications of the Central and Southern Flood Control Project are obvious. We have South Florida. We have um, massive um, metropolitan areas like Miami, Dade, and Fort Lauderdale, and, and uh, West Palm Beach. The ecosystem impacts uh, were also massive. So in the Everglades, we have uh, the ecosystem is suffering from too much water and too little water at the same time. We've lost between one half and two thirds of the historic Everglades footprint. Um, we have lost massive, we've had massive reductions in wading bird populations. Some estimate um, those losses to be as high as 90%. We have 68 threatened and endangered species in the region, dramatically degraded water quality, and I will, I will touch upon that a little bit more in a second. Um, we have repeated water shortage 
in a, a part of our nation which receives over 60 inches of rain, we have repeated to have repeated water shortage is a serious problem. And as time has progressed, our drought events have become more severe and more frequent. Um, and, and the results of that include also um, increasing saltwater intrusion into our uh, freshwater aquifers, which provide drinking water for those seven and a half million people. We've seen dramatically declining estuary health. And then in the process of all of that, we waste 1.7 billion gallons of water to tide every day. Next slide. Our formula for restoring the Everglades um, is quite simple, and our adventures, our restoration adventures, uh, led in part by our own rock salt here on this task force in the Kissimmee River, has proven to us that getting the water right is a pretty darn good restoration formula when it comes to aquatic systems. If you get the water right, and that means the quantity, timing, and distribution of flows through these riverine marsh systems and out to our coastal resources, the ecosystem tends to respond. Wildlife returns, um, plant species return, and then if you add to that a serious commitment to restoring water quality, um, it, it is a good formula for restoring these large-scale ecosystems. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this is a, a grossly incomplete time frame um, in Everglades restoration. I put it up here to make a, a, a couple of simple points. Number one, I think it's fair to say that the current modern era of Everglades restoration, really you could mark its beginning in the 1980s. And what has proceeded from the 1980s until today is a continuum of learning and action. And I think in the beginning we were uh, really trying to get our arms wrapped around the basic cause and effect um, scenarios in the Everglades. And from there we took uh, opportunities at early restoration, things like the Kissimmee River Restoration Initiative, which is north of Lake Okeechobee, where our constraints were formidable but manageable. And uh, expanding Everglades National Park, for example, was another opportunity that was taken early. Um, in the mid-1990s, uh, the Congress acted to create uh, a governance structure for the larger Everglades restoration effort. And, uh, and then th by creating the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force, that task force created a strategic plan, if that sounds familiar to this task force. We also, uh, in partnership with the members of the task force, uh, led by the Army Corps of Engineers in the South Florida Water Management District, created and developed a comprehensive restoration plan for the hydrologic piece for getting that water right. And that was the plan that was delivered to both the Florida legislature and the Congress in the year 2000. And after that, since then, we are now in the project implementation phase. And that is a phase we are likely to be in for the next 20 to 30 years. And, and you can see here that, um, that as, the, as the Water Resources Development Act goes, so, so does the progress in uh, Everglades restoration tend to go. All right, so then we're going to talk a little bit about the, the South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force. It was established in 1996 by the Congress. It's constituted very similarly to this one. We have our membership includes uh, seven federal members, many of the agencies that are represented here the South Florida Water Management District, two local government representatives, and then two tribal representatives, and also two representatives of the state of Florida. The Congress designated the Secretary of Interior to chair the task force. The role of the task force is to establish advisory bodies, and we'll talk a bit about that next. Coordinate science, and I, I listened keenly to the discussion earlier that the presentation that was presented to you about sort of the science that that is um, that you're bringing to bear on this effort that you're doing. And this coordinating science is a work in progress for us. Um, we, as many of our folks who are involved in our task force on this task force know, uh, coordinating science is one thing. Translating science into policy and decision making and building those bridges and finding folks who are fluent in both science and policy is a bigger challenge. And that's something that's, I think, an ongoing um, effort for us. It, I predict it will be an ongoing effort for you as well. Uh, our job is also to do conflict, interagency conflict resolution, assist and support the agencies to the extent that we can. We also prepare pretty detailed integrated financial analysis and plans. We are exempt from the Federal Advisory Committee Act. This is a key dimension of our task force. This means that we have a pretty broad ability to bring um, advisory groups together that represent a very broad base. Somebody asked a question earlier about 
How do you engage the NGO communities? How do you engage the academic communities? Our task force has done a lot of that, and our FACA exemption helps in that regard. We can establish our own advisory committees. We can also adopt existing advisory committees that are, that are effective. And here's another key fact about our task force. We do not have budgetary control. We don't have any money. We don't control um, the money that goes into the implementation phase. So what does that mean? That means that at the end of the day, the decision to spend dollars, the decision to implement projects still resides with the implementing agencies and entities that are responsible. But if this task force has done anything, and if anything has emerged over the last 20 years in Everglades restoration, it's a very mature culture of collaboration and partnership. And that partnership has worked, it's like a marriage. It takes constant work. There are some times when it's been rocky and sometimes when it's been good. I think currently for the last several years, I think our, our marriage has been a very healthy one and a very productive one. But um, it, this, this culture of collaboration and partnership, I think, is um, really thrives in the Everglades and is one of the hallmarks of our success so far. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, Congress also required the establishment of a Florida-based working group. Now, this is a larger group. This consists of many of the senior managers and representative scientists from the participant task force agencies. They meet more frequently than the task force does, and they actually help us do the work of the task force and implement sort of the task force's decision-making process. Um, next, <laughs> next slide. And then again, just quickly on our advisory bodies, our longest standing advisory body is our science coordination group. And um, it's a standing committee that, that advises the task force and the working group. But through the years, we've also had an official relationship with, for example, the Governor's Commission for Sustainable South Florida. I think there are some former members of that commission um, in the audience, uh, the Water Resources Advisory Commission. And both of these entities are actually entities of the state. And uh, yet the task force, because of our FACA exemption, are able to uh, formalize our relationship with them as advisory bodies. And then we also have the ability to convene advisory bodies at the specific project level um, if there is a need for conflict resolution at that, at that specific project level. Next slide. The task force developed a strategic plan, and I think this is the exercise that you are, are currently working through. Um, it begins, of course, with guiding principles and a vision, a very clearly stated vision, that a healthy South Florida ecosystem supports diverse and sustainable communities of plants, animals, and people. Um, we also went through a long exercise uh, developing indicators of success, something I think I just I heard mentioned on the task force. We have ecological indicators, and those include things like crocodilians and fish and macroinvertebrates. And for each of those ecological indicators, our scientists have developed why are those important ecological indicators? What is a healthy, what does success in a wading bird population mean? And then how do we put wading birds, for example, on the path toward restoration? And then we have compatibility indicators, which are not ecological, but rather indicators that we can measure that we are, feel pretty strongly are compatible with a restored ecosystem. Quantities of water, salt water intrusion into our aqu aquifers for, would be examples of compatibility indicators. Next slide. We have three strategic goals and objectives, and these it sounds to me like are very close to your own strategic goals and direct and um, objectives. Goal one, get the water right, and we have sub goals for each of those. Goal two is to reserve, restore, preserve, and protect natural habitats and species, and goal three is to foster compatibility of built and natural systems. I'm going to pause here to make what I think is an important point. Um, when the task force put together its strategic plan, if you, if you go and you look at it and you open it up, you see hundreds of projects. And what's important to note is that the task, those pro, not all of those projects are being, um, are, are, not all of those projects are being led by me necessarily members of the task force. Part of the task force's effort were to look out into the community and see what was happening. Some of these are, there are other regional authorities, there are local governments that are doing some of, particularly of goal three. Um, also, that exercise helped us identify where there were holes. And the biggest hole, of course, was getting the water right. It was attacking that flood protection system I showed you on the, on the, uh, on the map, attacking that at the appropriate scale. Nobody had done that. Nobody had looked at South Florida at that scale since they drained it 60, 70 years ago. So um, next slide, please. So, um, 
So a restoration plan was developed after taking a project inventory. New projects were developed and added. And um, the resulting plan was delivered to the Florida Legislature and Congress. And the important point here is that that plan that was authorized in 2000, it's still the plan, but it's a very adaptable plan. And, and, I, and I, would, I would say to you as you embark on this, and luckily you have folks who have been really engaged in Everglades for lo longer than I have, who know this, and that is that um, these plans, these initiatives, conservation, restoration at this scale takes a very long time. It outlives most of our careers. And so whatever plans you set forth have to have built into them a level of, of adaptability so that you can not only, not you, but the, those who come after you can take advantage of new opportunities, of new science. You're going to continue doing science and you're going to learn new things. You're going to be smarter than 10 years from now than you are today. And so it's really important that your efforts build um, adaptive management and adaptive implementation into them. Okay, the last I'll close with, uh, I just want to focus quickly on one of our restoration projects that was one of those authorized in, in authorized uh, uh, initially in 2000, it's going for final authorization in the next water cycle. This is the Caloosahatchee Estuary. Um, I'm locating it there on the map for you. The Caloosahatchee River it was connected to Lake Okeechobee, and its role in our, flood our modern flood protection system is to take the brunt of too much water. When there is too much water inland, we use the Caloosahatchee River as an escape valve for Lake Okeechobee. We open the gates and let the water flow. Next slide. And what the result of that is often ecological devastation. What you're looking at here is um, in conditions of too much flow, it's, it's kind of difficult to see on the left-hand side, but there is a black plume. You're looking south, um, so the lake in the mainland is to your left. Um, there is a black plume that's jutting out into the estuary in the Gulf. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, and it goes for miles, and it can last for quite a long time. Um, that is June 2005, obviously, a tremendous amount of water in the state, water, water everywhere, and the Caloosahatchee was taking an enormous brunt of, the, of providing flood protection inland. In 2005, the Caloosahatchee received 3.5 million acre feet of water from Lake Okeechobee and the surrounding basins. That's 3.3 million acre feet more than it actually needed. In June, a short three years later, we're in the throes of one of the worst droughts in South Florida history. And what you see there is right there, you're looking east, okay, you're looking east. So the green gunk that is on the sort of closer to you, that is the um, upstream side of a lock structure on the Caloosahatchee River. The river there is suffering from no flow at all. It's not getting it's stagnation. So you get these massive blue-green algae blooms. And you can see that as soon as that lock structure gets open for navigation, where is that green gunk going to go? It goes straight out the river into the estuary. Next slide, please. This is another tremendous, uh, this is also, it, mind you, this is not from 1976. This, this photograph is from 2008. This is blue-green algae. Um, next slide. Uh, uh, this is a slide, in my opinion, and I'm not a scientist, but for me, as a, as, a, as a policy person, this is about resilience. August in 2010, we had healthy tape grass in the Caloosahatchee River. Four months later, we had dead tape grass beds. This is a system that has no resiliency at all. As soon as the fresh water stopped flowing, we started losing tape grass beds, which are a tremendously important manatee wintering habitat. Um, and in fact, the Caloosahatchee is one of the most important um, manatee wintering habitats in, on the coast. Next slide. I've, I think I've got two more slides. Just more, and, and this, is, this, is, this is where I'm, I make my economic point. Um, you know, if you look up in the top right-hand corner, you are seeing a massive algae bloom right out the back lanai's of condo owners. And these algae blooms can last for months. That's a real economic impact. It's a real uh, blow to property values. If you looked at the lower left-hand corner, that gunk that you see piled up on the beach, that is um, a, 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 an algae that's called red drift algae. This is not red tide, okay? This is red drift al algae. That is piled up on the beaches of Sanibel Island. I don't know if any of, any of you have seen Sanibel, uh, ever been to Sanibel Island. We talked about it just last night. Um, that's one of the most pristine and beautiful uh, places in, in, of our Gulf resources in Florida. And that's a real economic 
um, impact there when those beaches are virtually unusable by piled up algae. And then finally, the little lower, the photograph in the lower right hand side is what happens to tape grass when. Um, when the water column becomes too dark and you don't get enough light penetration, it becomes, you get epiphytic growth on the tape grass and it becomes furry. And healthy tape grass is not furry, it's less useful to uh, marine mammals like the manatee. Next slide. So the restoration project is the only slide I have on it. It's quite simple. I'm a civil engineer. We probably have lots of civil engineers in the room. This is something, technology, we've probably been employing for thousands and thousands of years. It's basically a square reservoir. And the function that it serves is instead of, when there's excess water in the system, instead of dumping it out to the Clusatchee estuary, we put it in a reservoir. And we hold it there and then have flexibility to use it in a much more um, um, appropriate way during the dry season. This is about getting that quantity uh, timing and distribution, and then somebody mentioned um, the potential water quality benefits of doing retention mm -hmm. types of projects. The last slide is simply, um, next slide, oh, sorry. Um, and this shows you in the green the area, roughly 71,000 acres of, of um, estuarine and riverine resources that will benefit from the Caloosahatchee uh, C43 reservoir. So a direct benefit. Um, it doesn't solve all of the Caloosahatchee's problems, but it's a key, key part of restoring that really important resource. So I, th I think that's my last slide. Is that? Yes. So with that, thank you. And whew, I feel like I talked fast. But anyway. yeah, uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to ask. Them. Actually, we're going to have to take prerogative just because of schedule yes. and um, um, hold questions or maybe catch Shannon afterwards. Um, thank you. A quick bit of housekeeping. I think we're going to take a break. Sure. First, thank, thank you very you much, much Shannon. We're going to take, uh, obviously we're, we're a little behind schedule here, we're going to take a brief break to reorganize for uh, our listening sessions. We're going to have a couple presentations from, 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 uh, from uh, um, Grover Robinson with the local advisory government, uh, local government advisory committee in, in Escambia County, and, uh, and we will have, uh, as Brian described, a listening session.